Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 100. 100 episodes down and hopefully many more to go. I'm Sean and live from Windsor, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. You can join us Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern, at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, welcome everyone to this 100th episode of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. I'm still kind of shocked that we've made it this far. I got to say, it does not feel like Sean and I have sat down and did this 100 times. And to be honest, it's a couple more than 100 times because we had a couple special things we recorded, whatever. But anyway, in celebration of this milestone, uh, we're going to add in a new section to the show tonight. We're going to do a short retrospective. Uh, that'll fall after our usual feedback section. Look at your... Uh, and, and contributions to our content. Uh, then we've got some announcements, including the launch of our next giveaway. After that, we're going to answer what I think is probably one of the best and most important questions we've ever received since doing this. Now, once we tackled that, I've got a couple detailed reviews to go through. First up is going to be Katana from Tracy Allen, followed by Jaws from Ravensburger. When we get to the week in review, I've got my first thoughts on the Pathfinder Adventure card game and a couple plays of some classic two-player games that Deanna and I both love. Then, after we wrap up, we're going to try something special for those of you here live tonight, those of you who have taken the time to show up to join us for our 100th episode. Now, that's a lot to fit in, but it is a special episode, so we're going to waive our usual two-hour time limit, and we may be going long, but we're still going to try to keep it shorter. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We appreciate your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, you can send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media. I can be found pretty much everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Well, starting off, we have a comment from Patate Deuce on our best six-player games topic from mm -hmm. back in April. Patate has some games they would like to add to our list. Sure. Also, Decrypt, Detective Club, Unlock, any, Just One, and Dixit for six players. I'm going to prepare a six players game session with light games, non gamers group. Mm -hmm. And all the games I found was in your review. Oh, I'm with please. you. I'm with you with Sagrada. Great game, but not best at six, even with the expansion. Nice work. Well, thanks Petite. Uh, you, as usual, we'll, uh, we'll throw those into our show notes. Well, Peter shot has a comment on our folded space, eminent domain box insert build. I didn't even realize this was an option from Folded Space. Hmm. Would love to easily put all of the expansions into that single box. Maybe I'll get it during the next Kickstarter campaign. I appreciate the overview of the assembly. That was a lot easier than some of the wooden inserts for sure. Hmm. I would appreciate having a bottom for the cards, but that's a minor issue. Well, thanks for the comment, Peter. Uh, I'm glad to hear this one because I wasn't sure if recording and putting that box insert up the box insert build was worth it or not but i figure you know what i gotta build it anyway and if i'm gonna build it why not record it kind of like i do with most of our unboxing videos i'm just glad that someone out there actually found it useful to them and it seems like people seem to dig it so if i do get any future box inserts i'll probably continue to do a live build of them all right well mark McCog mccogno has some additions for our very popular two-player games for date night article hi Targi is great as well, and a hard-to-find but excellent game, Fjords. Hmm. Also, I have been playing Mandala, an excellent two-player game. Well, thanks, Mark. Again, we'll do the same thing here. We'll toss those in the comments if anyone else wants to check out those three games. Well, up next, a longer comment on our Chocolatiers video review on YouTube. Okay. Har Har writes, good points. I played it two-player about six times as well. At that count, it's hard to say if it's thinky or too random. Perhaps we were just lucky. Assuming you shuffle well, I found it pleasantly thinky and not that random. 
The basic complaint is undeniably that the tableau can become stale, but you get that in Everdale and many other tableau builders as well. Another negative is that both the chocolate deck and the tray decks are single tiered, so this is impossible to playtest exhaustively. The spatial aspect is very fun the first three times, and those <laughs> aha moments you indeed find in one or two games is a nice present to a non-gamer. You might need to play this 60 times to say if it's actually too random. Some of those, <laughs> it will be too random. I suspect gamers write this game off because of the low bonus points. Well, thanks for the comments, Har Har, though uh, not actually sure in the end if you did or didn't find the game too random. Kind of went back and forth there. I am glad that you enjoyed the game overall. It is a really cool game. And I do think that, that the, the wonder, the best part of Chocolatiers are those first few plays where the magic happens. Those moments where you're like, those aha moments really are wonderful. And that's the highlight of the game is when you first show it to someone new and you have them discover those moments and when you discover them for yourselves. I gotta admit, there's no, probably no way my copy is going to get 60 plays. Well, here's a comment from Peter Schultz on our Sorcerer review. Please note that Peter is one of the lead designers on the game as well as the, one of the artists. Wow. Peter was kind enough to say, thank you very much. I love your cast. Wow. Peter Schultz listens to us. That's awesome. I am honored. Thanks, Peter. All right, we saved these comments for last. It seems we touched a nerve with all our talk of culling and selling games. We got a large number of comments on that topic, and here are just some of them. First, there were those who just didn't understand the topic at all, like Scott Hammonds, who wrote, What is the purge you speak of? And Joe Liuzzi, who followed Scott to say, Scott Hammonds, I was just about to type the same thing in the next comment. And there was Phil Hatfield, who said, Purge? I don't understand the concept of which you speak. I buy games I want to own. I don't buy them to turn around and get rid of them. How can you play a game you no longer own? All right. And finally, Kathleen Genevieve, who wrote, I don't understand the question. Isn't that what buying more shelves is for? All right. I got to admit, I was amused. Uh, but I got to say, little do these people know that at some point, your collection will get to a point where you do actually feel the need to trim it down a little bit. Well, I think Kim Breeze is there, as she commented, I am facing this exact problem right now. Thanks for sharing. Well, Chris Groff chimed in with reasons he has gotten rid of games. The games that I no longer play because another game does that thing better. Mm -hmm. Or just games that I have plain lost interest in, like Small World and Castle Panic. Fair. And finally, Pipo Blastima noted, I do an analysis, scoring it. If it reaches less than acceptable... It goes. Interesting. See, that one caught my attention big time when I saw it. I think it was on Yumi Social. So I actually questioned Pippo on this one. And they went on to explain they had this system with various aspects of the game, like the replay value, the artwork, the number of times it had been played, all get ranked 1 to 10. And there were 10 different categories ranked 1 to 10. And if the game dropped below 70 out of 100, they got rid of the game which was interesting enough. But then what fascinated me is that they included some public stats, like how well the game reviews online. And that just seems strange to me because I can't see going, Oh, I got to get rid of this game. It dropped below a seven on board game geek. Like that just kind of blows my mind. That seems strange to me though. I admit it. You know what? I had a friend who collected anime and if it wasn't a popular enough anime, they found they actually lost interest in it. So maybe the, the, the public consciousness is a thing. Overall, though, I do want to thank everyone who's taken part in one of the many ongoing discussions about this particular topic of culling games. It's been a really interesting topic, and I am loving the amount of interaction we're seeing on this particular one. Like I said, we seem to have I either hit a nerve or we're confusing people. And even like Phil Hatfield, I went back and forth with him, and Phil has literally never gotten rid of a game. Every game he's ever bought, he still plays, and he blames me for buying bad games. That's the only reason you should be letting them go is because – you bought bad games in the first place. And I'm like, don't you believe in Jones theory? Like a new game comes out and it just does something better than that old game. He's like, nope. He's like, if, if a new game comes out that does something the games I already own have, I already own that game. It already does it. I don't need a new one. I'm like, fair enough to eat your own. Yep. And although I, I have to say, you you know, talking about using board game geek scoring, uh, a perfect example of, of reasons not to do that is uh, Frosthaven hasn't come out yet. Uh, and has over 300 reviews on Board Game Geek. Like, why? Can't they just disable that? 
Well, the problem is, and there, there was a lot of chatter about this today, and Isaac even jumped in and, and was, and, and Isaac said, oh, I don't care what it says on Board Game Geek anymore. Well, Reviews are meaningless um, because of the review bombing. But the problem is, there are legitimate reviewers like yourself who could review it legitimately in advance, mm -hmm. or people who go to Essen Spiel and play yes. the game there. You can review something legitimately, um, but realistically they should maybe store the reviews and and like you know most you can put in a release date on a game if you are a, a designer or you know whatever yeah you do have the option to, to put that information in there and they just hold all the reviews that are that are even even if it's you should be able to check off preview so right. if you had a preview copy, you can check that off. And that's, and what there should be is a totally separate rating for the preview version and the final because the game could have changed. Right. Because like, I, I went in and I rated Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria, for example, after playing the preview, mainly because I'm trying to help Daily Magic out and I liked it. Like I wouldn't have done this if I didn't like the game, but I gave it an eight. But when I play the final game, I'm going to go in and revise that because it won't be exactly what I played. And to be honest, that rating should get wiped once the game's out. Right. And, I don't and know. I, I think they're they're. I think they're. You know, Board Game Geek is not likely to add in a separate tier of reviews and, and rewrite their code enough yeah. to have that kind of thing. Uh, that but just don't make it a, live. Don't even have the button. Don't be yeah. able to review the game until the release date. Or like, like let make the publisher turn it on. Yeah. That would or certainly. even anyone can turn it on, and then it has to be approved by an admin, just like anything, everything else. Anything anything that's on Kickstarter can't be reviewed early until it actually gets yeah. in people's hands. No, um, exactly. So at least not a rating. You can put up a review. You can put up a post in the yeah, forum. Yeah. You can put up a file. You can put up a video. Yeah, yeah. Just no actual one through ten. Yep. Alrighty. A few quick announcements before we continue. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so please take a minute to like, subscribe, hit the bell, follow, or whatever you need to do on your preferred social media. If you were not on something that you where you are, let us know. We'll come over and sign in there too. Now, I, if for some reason I want a social media place where you hug people, I give you a hug. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop weekly in your email inbox. Once a week, I send out an email that recaps all the content we released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and anything else we create. You can sign up by going to newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or subscribe right there in the sidebar at tabletopbellhop.com. All right. It is our 100th episode, and I want a way for everyone to be able to celebrate and find, and, and I wanted to find a way to pay back our fans. So today we launched our latest giveaway. This giveaway starts today and will run for three weeks. We'll be drawing the winners during our live show Wednesday, August 12th. What I'd like to do is pass on two of the games I received to review in the last uh, two years, actually. These two games have been played a few times, but I, I would say they're in mint condition. I, I make sure to take care of my games. Yes, they're not new shrink wrap sealed, but you know what? Everything's already opened up and baggied and in nice shape. Uh, the games in question are going to be uh, something from the new hotness, something that just recently came out, and that is the Alpha from Bicycle Cards. And then something I picked up at Origins 2018 that I thought was really cool with some of the best components I've seen in a game and the best theme ever in a board game, and that is Dead Man's Cabal from Pandasaurus Games. During the draw in three weeks, we'll be picking two names. The first person picked will get a choice between these two games, with the runner-up getting the game that wasn't chosen. Now, I am sorry to say, due to the cost of shipping, we are going to have to limit entries to those of you here in Canada and in the U.S. To enter, you just have to head over to the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Now, as an added bonus, for those of you who took your time, took time out of your day to be here for this very special 100th episode of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, you probably noticed that Deanna has been dropping bonus entry codes into the chat room as the show's been going on. She's going to continue doing this throughout the show. Now, if you manage to stick around until the end, you will be for a total of 25 bonus entries. That's how much we appreciate you joining us tonight. Finally, 
Just a quick reminder that our Patreon patrons at the hotel guest or better level do get five bonus entries into all our giveaways as part of their standard rewards, which of course applies to this giveaway as well. So patrons, watch your Patreon notices. I haven't sent it out today. I'll be sending it out tomorrow. And for those of you who aren't patrons yet, here's just another reason you should support us. All right, lots going on all at once. Uh, you'd think we'd like launch this thing two years ago because it's not just our 100th episode that's giving us reason to celebrate right now. Next week marks our two-year anniversary of doing this whole tabletop bellhop thing. Not just the podcast, the whole thing, the blog, the whole, the whole shebang. And what we're going to do is we are going to host a live Q&A for that episode. And what I want to see is like, we're always looking for your game and game night questions. What I want is something different. I want real AMA questions. Like I want questions about Sean and I, or questions about the podcast or our live show or how we do things or behind the scenes stuff. You've always wondered what mics we use, where we get our equipment. What I want to do is be able to share stuff we've learned in the two years we've been doing this. It doesn't have to be recorded to the podcast. It could be recorded to the blog. If you have SEO questions, if you want to know the best hosting company to use, what companies we use, who hosts our podcast, any of that stuff. I, I want people to tap our expertise of... Our, 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 I wouldn't call us experts, but our two, put the two years of experience we have doing this to use for you. Besides joining us live, you can send in questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or leave us a voicemail on Skype. Just dial up Sean at tabletopbellhop.com and leave a message after the beep. Due to it being our anniversary, there is a chance we may have a surprise or two in store next episode as well. So here we are sitting down to record our 100th episode of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. So I thought this would be a good time for us to take a moment or two and take a look back at how far we've come, how the show's changed and evolved since we, we started this show about two years ago now. Now, what many people may not know is that the actual initial seed for this whole tabletop bellhop thing happened at Breakout Con that was downtown Toronto in 2018 over March break. Specifically during a dinner discussion at one of the Duke pubs. I don't remember which Duke it was, Duke of something. That's a thing in Toronto. There's all these pubs that are Duke of this, Duke of that. So I had had the idea to get Mo's wealth of gaming knowledge recorded for others to benefit for from for some time. Uh, with a side benefit, I'd get to spend more time talking to a friend I'd known for longer than anyone else. And frankly, since living three hour more hours away, I missed hanging out with. Uh, I tossed the idea around once or twice before. I've been yeah. a huge podcast fan uh, for many years. Uh, but that breakout dinner was the first time we really started actually talking about it. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it helped that. Uh, Anshi Games was there too because uh, yep. I had someone who supported me in the idea that yes you know a lot of information other people could benefit from um, yeah, I gotta admit personally I was like what, what, no one wants to listen to me was, was pretty <laughs> much my attitude at the time so we uh, we kept ed uh, talking back at base camp at the hotel uh, for uh, breakout con but while I thought the, the idea certainly had more legs than it ever had when we talked about it before I really didn't think it was likely still, and I generally kind of moved on. Mm -hmm. um, little did I know that life events were about to shake things up and provide opportunities uh, and troubles that we <laughs> hadn't expected. Yeah, so what happened next was a big lifestyle change for me, because in June 2018, I suddenly found myself with a lot of time on my hands. I was let go from my longtime job in quality in the auto industry of over 22 years and provided with a significant pension package for my many years of service. This gave me a chance to reevaluate what I was doing with my life and take a chance on doing something that I love for a living. So with uh, a bunch of back end development happening, our first episode was recorded on July 26, 2018 and released to the public on July 29th. Mm -hmm. Back then we recorded the show on Thursday nights uh, starting at 8.30 and tried to keep our, uh, actually, no, we were at 9.30 then. Were we? Uh, and we tried started to, earlier. And tried to keep our episodes under 45 minutes. We'd yeah. actually been starting later because we were putting our kids to bed <laughs> 
and then coming down to record afterwards. So that was that was the original reason we uh, we started when we did. Yeah, back then the show was a little tighter in a way, but we didn't have the feedback session because while well, we were brand new, so we didn't have any feedback yet, really. Um, uh, at the time, our weekend review was actually called the Tabletop Gaming Weekly, and that was actually the top of the show. The first thing we talked about every week was what games we had been playing. Uh, from there, we moved on to the Ask the Bellhop segment, which is pretty much same as it is now, and finished off with a check-in for the lobby, the chat room. And that was pretty much it. Uh, the other thing, too, is even back then, we didn't even have the same name because I hadn't even thought of SEO purposes or things like that at the time or the fact that people might search podcasts and search for gaming podcasts. So the show used to be called Tabletop Bellhop Live. Yeah, and uh, of course, we had the uh, the other logo as well. But now yep. one thing that hasn't changed about the show over the years is the Ask the Bellhop section mm-hmm. of the show. Answering your gaming and game night questions always was and always will be the heart yeah. of the show, uh, as it's the helpful bellhop concept that the entire brand is built around. Yeah, the whole cardboard concierge, we are here to help you. Back then, and for quite some time, our episodes always started with me writing a blog post. I always wrote up the Ask the Bellhop article first before the actual podcast recorded and then used that to generate the show notes. And the same thing with the Tabletop Gaming Weekly. I used to do a weekly blog post that was uh, the Tabletop Bellhop Weekly that was part of the What Did You Play Mondays thing, something Chris Cormier started. And I used to do that every week until Deanna pointed out just how terrible that is as evergreen content on a blog. Yeah, and that was pretty much it for our content. Uh, yeah. I would do my editing thing and release the YouTube version of the show at the same time as the audio versions, bright and early Tuesday mornings, so that when folks got up and out of bed on Tuesday, it would be in their podcatcher, ready for them if they subscribed, mm-hmm. as we know you all have. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, boy, have I learned a lot when it comes to audio editing about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the quality of some of those first shows is all over the map, over-edited, under-edited. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had, we've gone through various different mics and audio setups uh, over the years. We've had, you've, you've had at least three different mics, including yeah, the headset. Uh, so it's, it's there it's have been, been a, a lot of changes. So over time, we played around with what we were doing and tried a few new things. And and I don't know, if, I don't know how to word it. We we didn't get any feedback a lot of times. So what we had to go on was just listens and views and likes and a number of comments, right? So uh, especially like YouTube, you just look at the views. So we would sit there and, and play around with things, right? So one of the things we had heard that if you're trying to grow your podcast, you need to interview people. So we tried that. We had, we had three different guests on, great interviews, but they just, I don't know, they had mixed results. I, I think part of the problem was whenever we interviewed someone, we strayed away from our mission statement. We weren't doing an Ask the Bellhop. We weren't answering questions. We were interviewing people. So that didn't go so great. Uh, YouTube seemed really low compared to what we were hoping for. And we thought it was the length of the show that was the problem. So then we started producing 15 minutes of the show. So every time we do a podcast recording, I would then go in on the next day and do this tabletop bellhop express 15 minute thing. And Sean was adding animations and I actually thought it was really cool. And I thought it would do great. And that did not take off at all. Yeah. And unfortunately uh, the time, I mean, it was a 15 minute YouTube content, but the time it was taking us to generate that 15 yeah. minutes of YouTube content was pretty incredible because Mo would have to take take the content from the show episode, write a script for the 15 minute show, mm-hmm. record that. I would have to take that, edit in overlays and you know video images and and whatever I could to to spice up the content and give it that um, you know evening news sort of feel with like yeah. over the shoulder animations, uh, and then get all that all that and rendered out and and released. Uh, and we actually had a pretty short turnaround too because we were doing a Sunday release. Yeah. Uh, and you didn't record until Friday. So basically Saturday was, you know, three or four hours of me madly editing away and, and, and getting it all ready so that we could go with it on Sunday before you would have to do all of the, you know, SEO and, and, uh, stuff that you do on your end. And then I tried to do it all in one take, which that, that alone was the mistake. If I hadn't tried to do it all in one take, I think once out of all the episodes I recorded, I managed to do it in one take all the rest of like, Nope, try again. Nope, try again. And then by the fifth one, I just sounded tired. So it didn't sound very good. Yeah. It wasn't great. It wasn't great. 
and I, it didn't work. Like, I, I don't know. To be honest, those videos are still on YouTube. I should look. Maybe, like, over time they've gotten a bunch of views, but I doubt it. I think they just – part of the problem was you're taking, like, a, a hour and a half amount of content, squeezing it into 15 minutes, and you're just scratching the surface on everything. Right. You didn't. We didn't get to any of the deep dive or the conversation. So, well, we added special episodes. Uh, we live streamed some of our parties. Yep. We tested giveaways and tried a few early teaching and building videos that actually have never seen no. the light of day. Uh, we weren't very good at them, and <laughs> we're still figuring out a lot of the technical aspects, a process which will never end, I'm sure. Uh, but I mean, we, we discovered things like don't put a, a camera on a tabletop when you're building a wooden insert yes. hammer. Uh, yeah, um, you never, there's just stuff you don't think of, right? Right. Yeah. So but, yeah, uh, I had, I did, we recorded a, what, four and a half hour or so yeah. Gloomhaven box insert view, yeah. which we just had feedback today that people dig watching yep. people build the box inserts, but we did it all with the camera on the table. And this is a very, there was lots of hammering. And, yeah. And it's a wooden solid. The table and yeah, it was bad. Yeah. And we were, we were trying some other things. We had some, some old DSLR recording things that were limited in, in how long they could record at a time. And so we were having all sorts of multiple camera issues yeah. and uh, you know, it's, it is what it is. So one of the things that changed over the years, which is pretty obvious for anyone here live tonight, is uh, we're no longer on Thursday. And all that was, the reason for that is I realized we were trying to compete with Critical Role. And that made no sense with the gaming industry. Like, we were trying to talk to gamers, and 90% of the gamers right now are watching a different stream right now because Critical Role had exploded. Not that it's not still popular, but it's not quite the... I don't know, even know what you want because the steamroller it was at the time. Uh, so that was one. So we moved to Wednesday night. Um, we did also start a little bit earlier because our kids were getting a little older and could get themselves to bed a little bit easier. And we've obviously added a few more segments to the show. So one of the big ones, of course, is our feedback section. Personally, I really like feedback sessions when I listen to other shows. And I something I definitely wanted to encourage because one of the things that we have also strived to do is be about you, be about the listener, not just in the fact that we're answering your questions, but we want to interact with you. We want to read off your content. We want to talk back and forth. We want discussions to happen. And then even more so with our chat room here on Twitch, having people here live to be able to interact with is fantastic. So as we kept adding things to the show, it kept getting longer. We yeah. blew past our original 45 minute goal, pretty early, well, that limit goal pretty early and then moved mm -hmm. on to an hour and then an hour and a half. And now we're, we're cheering if I can, uh, yes. I can send out a message saying I got us under two hours. Yeah. There's just so much to talk about. Like, I honestly don't, I can't even believe we could make it under 45 minutes. Like, like yeah. one review is 45 minutes now. Like, I, I just, I don't <laughs> quite know how we managed to pull that off. But part of it was getting the review copies in. Like, it was a little different. We were more talking casually about the games we've been playing. Right. And now, wow, now we're trying to fit in two reviews a week, which I do plan to keep doing for a while. So, I don't know. Uh, the other thing, too, is we also, besides the podcast, like anyone listening right now obviously listens to the podcast, or if you're here live, you're going to see us record it. But we do do other types of content now. Um, I started doing unboxing videos. Literally every game I get now, I'm going to do an unboxing video, whether that's one I purchased, one that we got for review, one I got for a gift. Heck, I've even gotten, I've given my kids games for gifts and then unboxed them uh, with the kids, actually, which has been pretty cool. Uh, we started recording actual play videos, which just kind of started off with random games here and there. It's like, hey, we got the camera, let's do it. So like there's there's a recording of Deanna, Sean, and I playing Sorcerer 3 player. And there, there's some, I can't even remember some of our earlier extra plays. Um, I know there's a bunch of like two or three kingdom shadow kingdoms of Valeria, not shadow kingdoms valeria card kingdoms the valeria when that came out so we started doing that and then we decided to actually dedicate friday nights to live streaming specifically and that was playing Gloom. so that launched on january 11th 2019 and we introduced ktor to the world Yes. Our Gloomhaven streams and the video on demand versions of them created after the fact still remain some of our most popular content uh, yeah. short of the FAQ. <laughs> Which is still Gloomhaven. So, yes. <laughs> so it's interesting because I don't, I, I honestly don't know how much overlap there is, but I don't think we get the same people who join us for the podcast or read the Ask Bellhop videos are the same people who watch our Gloomhaven actual streams. Right. No, they so, there might be some. Like I know Tech does like to join us 
for for our Gloomhaven streams, and Ryan will join in if he's available. But I, I wonder what the Venn diagram is there. Thank yeah. you very much, Cold Dirk. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's uh, it's it's not. There are a lot of names I see on. Uh, like it's a different set of names on on Friday nights that I don't see here, other than you know checking a couple of people who who try to drop in whenever we're we're live, yeah. no matter what. Um, but you know, there's the, like the guys in the chair for our g- yes. folks, folks so, in, yeah, folks that's, in that's the chair. A we, we, we added our, our honorary fourth bellhop, um, uh, which is Tamujin, who we call our guy in the chair. He is the person who joins us for pretty much every Gloomhaven live stream and points out when we screw up the rules, which happens pretty often, surprisingly for the games. So another thing that changed for us in 2019 is we started to attend gaming conventions as the tabletop bellhop team, like as, as guests, like we're not just buying tickets and going to these cons. And for me, this was like the the first time this happened was breakout con 2019. And this was the first thing that to me validated what we were doing. Like that made me feel like we made it. Like they wanted us there as tabletop bellhop. They gave us a media badge. We were there to talk about the con and promote the con and talk about our experiences. And they liked what we did enough that they invited us back the next year. Like automatically, they're like, all right, we loved what you did. Next year, you're back. You're free. You're, you, you can come back. And that was awesome. And then after that hit Origins the same year, and that was an even bigger leap, like a bigger step for us. While I still, thanks pandemic, don't make it to very that many cons, uh, the benefit of a reviewer getting face-to-face time with game companies cannot be understated. Uh, for me, personally, it's more of a media aspect. Uh, mm. For my first instance at Breakouts, uh, I hung out in the panel room and, and took photos and notes. Uh, and I ended up writing up the, the website or the article for the panel content from Breakout. And so that's, you know, again, that's sort of... Th- me with a camera is, is more uh, more comfortable than, uh, you know, FaceTime with, with the board game designers, which yep. I leave to uh, you. No, that was fine, though. That's a part of it, right? Yep. That's part of the, the putting up the, the Facebook pages, the, the, the Twitter, the Twitter pictures, the, hey, this panel was awesome. And I'm just going to pause in our notes here to strongly thank Animal Leslie, who's just awesome enough to gift a whole bunch of people in our chat room with subs. So thank you very much, Animal Leslie. Thank you. All right, so the biggest thing for me, like the biggest shift, the biggest change, like felt like a life-changing moment was Origins 2019. This is when I now felt like I did this full-time as a job. This is when my pile of shame got replaced, well, sorry, rather overshadowed by my pile of obligation. Um, This is when the whole thing became a job for me. It was no longer just me talking about the games I already owned and the games I enjoy from that point on most of the games we talk about on the show as well in the review segments at least have been review copies of games we're still playing a lot of my old stuff uh which comes up during like the week in review but most of the reviews have been have been uh content that was given to us by publishers and this made a huge impact on like my entire life as far as how things work, right? Like when I played games, how often I played games, who I played them with, because I now had to get certain games played and even more so completely changed the way I purchased games. During this time, we continued to tweak and refine. One big change was moving the Ask the Bellhop segment to the front of the show. We Mm. had a discussion about it and decided that since it was the main focus of the show, we wanted to highlight it and it should be at the beginning so that if people weren't able to stay up late, because we do, uh, we do tend to run long these nights, uh, the Ask the Bellhop is that content that we wanted people to have. And another thing we've done too, that seems to be working wonderfully well. I don't even know when we started this. Was this late 2019, early 2020? I can't uh, remember that's now. That's 2020. We started. Yeah, it was 2020. So just this year was on YouTube. So taking the main podcast video, which is a big two and a half hour long thing on average before, because the YouTube's not edited down much, except for having a couple sections cut out and breaking it into separate videos on YouTube. And we do this because we know we have fans that prefer different parts of the episode, right? There's people who did as a bellhop. There's people who only care about the reviews. So we separate out that content and put it out that way because I know most people aren't going to stick around for a full two hour episode, especially on YouTube. It's just not how people consume YouTube. Now I do know there are some people out there that do listen to the whole show and we appreciate it. And that's why we'll continue to produce the whole show, but we definitely are seeing a lot more interaction and views for people watching segments of the show. 
Yeah, especially with the reviews, because that also gives publishers something that they yeah. can link to and, and you know, say, hey, look at this review of our product. Exactly. Whereas a publisher is going to have a harder time saying, hey, tune to minute 147 mm -hmm. of this episode. So yep. uh, the, the reviews are a no-brainer, uh, no but if, some, yeah. if people did, were interested in other content getting broken out, for instance, the What Did You Play we, uh, section only exists in our full podcast. Uh, yeah. We've never broken that out because... Well, we did. We tried well, it we for tried. two <laughs> but, weeks and it had like... Two yeah, but no one, no for... one seems to care. So yeah. <laughs> if, if people do care, you need to speak up or uh, you won't get it back. So as time goes on, We'll continue to refine what we're doing. This could be yeah. adding new content or improving what we're already doing. We're yeah, always that's... looking to improve and always looking for feedback from you, our fans, on what we can do better. Yeah, we, we say it multiple times during the show. I'll say it again. It's just at tabletopbellhop.com. So Mo at Tabletop Bellhop, Sean at Tabletop Bellhop. If you got any feedback, we'd love to hear it. So November 2019 is is the next big milestone. I know I kind of jumped ahead to 2020 with the, the YouTube breakout. Again, I couldn't quite remember when that happened, but this was a big one for, for me particularly because this is when my employment insurance ran out. Because as I noted earlier, the thing that gave us the opportunity to even attempt to do this full time was losing my job in the auto industry and that generous severance package. Well, when that severance package ended, I was able to use our, our pretty solid employment insurance program here in Ontario. But eventually that ran out, which was in November 2019. And that's when we had to sit down, Deanna and I, and figure out if we could budget it, if we could do this full time, or if I need to go out and start flipping burgers or doing quality audits again. And I am very happy to report that here I am right now, still doing this full time. And 100% of that is due to our fans, our supporters, the people who join in, the people who, who support our Patreon, everyone who consumes our content in any way. Not only would I not want to do this if no one seemed to be paying attention, but we couldn't do this if it wasn't for you. Yeah, a special thanks, of course, to our Patreon backers who choose to support us financially, but to the rest of you as well, everyone who listens, reads, and watches our content, yeah. uh, those that interact with us online and take the spread, time to spread the word about what we're doing here. Thank you all. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. It's, uh, it, you know, again, I, I, I'm not... Tech, I'm a part of the bellhop team as, as much as anyone, but uh, I'm not financially reliant on it. I, no. you know, I do have a day job I work on, but I was around for some of those, uh, those decisions. And it was a, it was a tough decision to make. I mean, it was, we were, you, you guys were walking off a cliff um, yeah. without a safety net any longer. Um, and uh, we appreciate everyone who has supported us in that. Yeah. And so far it's working and I would love to continue to be able to do this. We love people who drop in and take part in our chat room, the lobby. If you are here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell with more chat and content that otherwise only our patrons get. All right. The main message I have for our lobby here tonight, which is fantastic, which we're, we're going to, we're going to stay in here for a little bit. I think today, uh, say hi to a few people. We are going to try to do something special to celebrate this hundredth episode milestone by throwing an online party. So while you're enjoying the rest of the episode, be sure to make sure you've got a copy of Zoom installed or you at least can go to the Zoom website, you use the plugin because we are gonna invite all of you to join us in the penthouse suite here live on the stream, chatting with each other. All we do ask is that when you first join, mute your mic and then we'll introduce you and you can say hi and stuff like that. So I, I strongly recommend installing the Zoom app, but that's not the only way to do it. You can just do it web-based. Yep, absolutely. And uh Thank you so much to everyone who's joining us in our chat room this week. We've got a ton of people out there, a ton of people saying congratulations on your 100th yes. episode. And we really appreciate uh, everyone out there from our patrons and uh, regular visitors. And a special thanks goes out to Animal Leslie, who we mentioned in the stream, uh, gifted those subscriptions to uh, a group Yeah, of that people. is awesome. Thank you so much for that. I see people dropping some, uh, what are they called, bits? Is bits. that what they're called? Yep. I can't. This is how much I know. <laughs> twitch i'm terrible yeah. at twitch I, I there are a lot of people in our chat tonight some of our our, our long-term fans who are here with us every week which we always appreciate and i see some new names as well which is awesome well, we got a question we might want to uh we might need to take the research on to do for next week which is how many gallons of coffee have been consumed during oh, the show God. Uh, i have a no lot. idea <laughs> um <laughs> i have no that idea is it's a, been a big lot. number no matter what 
We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through the website. That way they get tracked and I get a nice email notification. I'm still not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Today, we've got one of the most deep questions I think we've ever been asked. Uh, Mojitaba Zeriper simply asks, why do you play board games? I, I love it. I got to say, I love it. I love this question. When I first saw this question come up, I was just like taken aback. I'm like, wow, like, like that's, it's such a simple question, but so deep, right? Like, like this is a question that applies to every other question we've ever talked about. Like, this is the, the core. Why do we do this, right? We've been talking about games and game nights for 100 episodes now. And this is the first time anyone thought to say, why? Why, why do you do this? Why, why do you care about board games? Why, why do people play the games we do? I, I think this, I, as soon as I saw this and we were like, what's going to be our topic for episode 100? I'm like, no, this is perfect. This is like the ultimate question. Forget to know us. It's episode 100. Why do we game? And honestly, just as no one's ever asked us, I wonder how many listeners have ever asked themselves this question beyond the, it's fun, you know, answer. Yeah. Oh, it's true. Like, how many people actually deep dive? Like, why do they do this? Why do we play these games? Why do we take part in this hobby? Why do I want to talk to you about it? Why do I want to spread the joy? Now, going back to our, our roots, right? What we just talked about when we were doing a little recap there is we are here to answer your gaming and game night questions. And we strive to improve everyone's game night. That's what we do. So what I want to do is of course, broaden this topic. Well, yes, I want to talk about what Sean and I play board games. Why do we do it? But I also want to talk about why do people in general play board games? What are the various reasons people play games? And a brief apology to the RPG gamers out there. We're just going by the question, but there is a lot of overlap on the topic. So we're sure yeah. you'll get something out of this as well. If you just ignore the board part of our, uh, whenever we say board games. Yeah, it's, it's going to apply to most of them. I'll admit there's a few things I personally think are a little specific to role playing. Maybe we could deep dive that topic, but you know what? We're going to stick to board games tonight. That was the question that was asked. So. All right, I, this is going to be mostly unscripted because I didn't even know how the best way to talk about this was. But what I was thinking of is, is a bunch of things. And what I'll do is I'll point out if this is something that I think people do or if it's something that I personally believe in. All right, you might have to cut this. Just fair warning, it seems a storm has started. Oh. <laughs> and we may have to worry about power outages. Okay. Just a heads up. I'm like, is that what I think I hear? And I'm like, yes, that is what, yeah, definitely. Okay. So Good fair day. warning. If, if I do cut out. Yeah. Mo might go away. I won't. My power, my power lines are all underground. So I'm, yeah. <laughs> I, I, the stream will stay up, but without the bellhop, it's a little, uh, little dry yeah. content. So, so just fair warning. Uh, plus the, where we are, if there's loud thunder, our, it'll flicker. Like that's how great our power is here. <laughs> the, the, you know, a big boom is enough to cut it out for a couple seconds. Right. All right. So getting that heads up that just totally confused me because i had, <laughs> i hadn't seen anything warning anything today and i was just like what the hell is that sound i don't know maybe the overheating mode is causing a problem we'll air that off a bit now <laughs> all right so on to reasons people uh play board games and one of the biggest for myself is it is a way to socialize with other people. It's a, it's a way to get together with other people and do something. Uh, it gives you something to do when you're hanging out with other people. So you're not just, you know, standing around talking about the weather or the storm outside. Um, it, it's a great excuse to get together with friends and it's something for all of you to do together. It's also a great way if you aren't a people person, because that's me. I am an introvert. I've got my wonderful little uh, office dungeon here and it's fantastic. I don't need to talk to people, uh, but I should talk to people. Talking to people and interacting with people with is a very good thing. I'm, you know, we're not going to get into the psychology of it, but he, human interaction in is general. important as a as a species in general. And so, uh, if you're out there playing a board game for introverts like myself or people with social anxiety, having that game to focus on 
allows you to be more comfortable socializing with other people who are playing the game with you because you can narrow down on the game if things are getting tense or, or you're you're having some anxiety issues mm -hmm. or you can sit back and you can have a great conversation with people and it's just a fantastic way to interact with people and still have a buffer as mm -hmm. well yeah, one of the things that is great about board games is it gives you a similar interest, right? Everyone who's sitting down at the table is sitting down to play the game. It's, it's the same reason I love gaming conventions, because I have something in common with every other person I'm going to see. I'm not going to get that going down to Devonshire Mall. There's going to be a bunch of people there, and I'm going to be furious that they're not wearing their masks properly. Whereas I go to a game convention, there's going to be a bunch of smart people that realize that plus one AC is still plus one. will be wearing their masks, and we also enjoy games like it's it's the one thing you're going to have a similar interest and because of that games can be a great way to meet people with similar interests whether that's just looking for more companionship or literally looking for a friend like trying to find people who have common interests to hang out with more often it's a great gateway to to making new friends meeting new people uh getting involved in larger social groups Absolutely. And you know what? There's I, I've made some great friends through gaming. And actually, most of my gaming friends have been made through role playing games, uh, you know, in the in the early years. Board gaming is is a little more narrow. But again, when I do get down to uh, Windsor and we sit mm -hmm. down at the at the game stores on a on a game night on a, for your birthday or just for a, a regular weekend. It's great to, you know, meet up with some of those mm -hmm. other Windsor gamers who I would probably have never interacted with otherwise. And sometimes, uh, you know, last time we were in easy mode, I ran into John, who I hadn't mm -hmm. seen in probably 20 years. So, yeah, someone else that we both knew from grade school, who is a local gamer, who is yeah. really big on um, Pokemon right. is, is his big thing. But he's also really big into social deduction and party games, which is why I love to have him at my events so he can go do those somewhere <laughs> else while I go play a real game. <laughs> yep. No, I joke, obviously. They're all good games, each game for different people. Absolutely. So another aspect of it, which again goes with socializing, is to feel like you're part of a community. Again, this gets into psychology. This is something as a human we need. We want to belong as part of a group. And being part of, being a gamer as one on its own, by being a board gamer, you are self-identifying with a bunch of other people who self-identify as being board gamers. That alone puts you as part of a bigger worldwide community, but also locally, right? There's the local game store. There's your 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 local comic book shop that you, you play games at. There's the um, gaming cafe, or there's just the group that you get together with with your friends on the weekends and play games together. It's, it's being part of something. It's being being a member, being ingrained in a community that can be very important to people and even if you are stuck in a one horse backward town where there aren't any other gamers the online gaming uh world exists whether you're you know playing magic through the app because you don't have anyone to play with your deck real decks or you're hopping onto tabletop simulator and playing uh, in tournaments or whatever, or over on Tabletopia, or as one of my favorites, Board Game Arena, with mm -hmm. my 14 uh, constant games going on. You know, I'm playing with people from you know, Seattle and Portland and all across America on yep. Board Game Arena, and we are a community. And sometimes we reach out and chat on Twitter, but most of the time, it's just a couple of messages ba passed back and forth or no discussion at all. The game is our discussion. Mm -hmm. Um and even that's a community. Uh, so whether whether you've got uh, FLGS where you can all sit down and you know have a have a drink and play a game, or you know, and that means pop. It doesn't have to be an adult beverage, uh, but yeah. you know, have a have have something to to share and uh, in person or digitally, especially in this mm -hmm. pandemic world, uh, the community is there and it is real. Plus, there's also the digital community online. Pretty much any game that has any following has some type of group or forum or message board or Twitter account or whatever Facebook page where you can interact with other fans of that game. Now, most of us, I, as far as I know, most of our listeners are like us and they're polygamers and play lots of things, but there are people out there who just play Catan or just play train games or just play Warhammer or just play War Machine. And there are communities for those specific games as well, which is, another great way to interact with other people and the other thing is games can be a way to build a community now this is one i'm speaking of mainly from personal experience because 
I started off with someone who basically inherited a game collection from my father. Now, my father, unfortunately, didn't get a lot of plays with his games. Uh, being an adult now, looking back, I have to assume my dad was way more of an introvert than I thought, despite the number of sports he played. He just never connected with a community of gamers. He had one friend that he played board games with, and he played maybe twice a year with them, and that's it. So his games just gathered dust. And I think that was the main drive from me creating what I called the Windsor Gaming resource back in 2002 where i used games to build a community i went i'm going to be at a knights of columbus on saturday i'm going to bring these five games if anyone wants to play them show up and the first week we had three people the next week we had eight now the facebook group for the windsor gaming resource has 600 members so gaming can be a way to build a community if there isn't one already and also uh, be a part of a former community. Uh, I have I've been involved with the Windsor Gaming community from way back before Facebook existed mm. uh, in the, the PHP P board days um, because I moved away from Windsor. But at the time, there were still a lot of people, Mo included, that, you know, I wanted to hang out with and talk about games and talk about, you know, what the, the, the cool new nerd stuff was. Um, and I had that community already established. Mm -hmm. So even though I was building my own life and community four hours away, there was still that connection to the original community that was able to be kept in this modern age. Mm -hmm. So moving away from community for a bit and socializing, uh, another reason people play games, and this is one that I personally love about gaming is, um, I'm trying to think of that. I've got these in a weird order on my list. And I don't even know how to mention them first, but, but basically using your brain. Right. So being dedicated to lifelong learning. Now, I'm, some people do this by taking university courses or always reading novels or always reading books. For me, I like to keep my brain active by learning new games and playing new games and challenging myself to play the games I already know better. Like the, the whole mental workout of playing games. This is why I like heavy games. Why I like epic games and long games. And I like, uh, perfect information abstracts it's that mental exercise the the mental gymnastics that keeps your brain fresh now we'll be we'll be clear the brain exercise isn't technically a thing you're not going to get yourself smarter like these apps keep promising on various platforms <laughs> but your brain is good at what it does so playing games keeps it uh keeps it skilled at playing games uh it's right. not going to make you better or anything else but uh there, there's other things you are doing. So if you're reading lots, you are working on vocabulary and things like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, while brain training may not be a thing, there is definitely something to be said about even just the reading of rule books <laughs> yeah. as, as, a, as a way to keep, you, um, keep your brain active and, and going. See, personally, I like the, and, and there's, there's also an aspect of ego involved in this, that playing hard, difficult, heavy games makes me feel smart. It makes me feel good. It makes me like, man, I, I played Vinhos well, and I figured out that thing, and I predicted what you were going to do, and I did the thing, and it worked, and it was awesome, and I'm brilliant. Did you see what I did? Look how damn smart I am. It feels good. Absolutely. And I have to say for me, uh, especially because I'm that whole different kind of gamer, you know, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the parachute in gamer who, who drops in for a weekend, plays nine games I've never touched before and leaves again. Uh, I love the thrill of, of getting a game because it doesn't always mm -hmm. happen. Sometimes you get that, that one delivery game that doesn't make any sense. And you, you realize you know, a third of the way through that the wasteland has, uh, has walked away with your entire, uh, uh, thing and you've just messed it all up. So it's a good social experience. Uh, yeah. And then other times you go, oh, oh, wait, you know what? Pulsar, you know, that game works for me. It just mm -hmm. makes total sense. I sat down at this huge table hog and I get it and I want to do it again. Yeah. Um, and and, and the, those moments uh, are so fantastic to, to be able to have. And, and the difference of them, like there's something to be said. You know, I have complained any number of times about Wasteland Delivery. Uh, mm -hmm. but I also said, I want to play it again because I want to see if I can yeah. get it right. Yeah. There's definitely a, a, a reward feeling from, from figuring out a game and, and playing it well, and then figuring out something new for a game. So this isn't a big one for me, at least I don't think so. Like maybe deep rooted psychologically, but uh, to me, this, I know it is for other people. Um, there are people 
who play games just as a distraction. Like it's, it's something to do. It's a, it's a way to pass the time. It's, it's, it's better than sitting there doing nothing. <laughs> um, digging a little more deep. It can be a way to take your mind off things. Now I will agree. I do play games for this somewhat. Like if I'm stressed out and I don't want to think about the innumerable amount of crap going on in the world right now, because there is a lot of it in 2020 right now, playing a game will take my mind off that. I wouldn't call it the main reason I play games, but it's definitely an aspect that it's nice to forget about those other things for a while and just worry about how many points I'm going to get in the last round or if I'm going to be able to connect the route from Naples to New Orleans. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I there, there are certain games where I'm going to sit down and I'm going to play them because we have to review this. And if I've played it, I can talk about it in the show more freely than just sort of nodding along with, with what you have to say. Um, mm. You know, like I today we've got two reviews. I have played Jaws. I haven't played Katana. Um, but I'm not always going to necessarily want to enjoy that kind of game. Uh, again, yeah. Ticket to Ride. Tra the route building games don't do it for me at all. No, no real interest in them. But I'm going to sit down. And again, I'm going to sit down with you and D and, you know, Sean, Sean yeah. Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, uh, yeah. or whoever, in order to have a good social experience because that's why yes. I'm there. Uh, whereas again, if, you know, sitting down to Pulsar, I'm, I'm diving in because this yeah, game rocks. I mean. So another reason people play games is also escapism. Now, again, I'm no psychologist, neither is Sean. I don't want to get into the details of this. This can be good or bad. I will just leave it at that. Some escapism in general is good, but then you don't want to go too far. Yeah. But some people do do it for that reason. And this, this is, this is a bigger thing. You know, we talked about uh, role-playing earlier. This is a huge, a huge aspect of role-playing is, is some mm. level of escapism, either intentionally or not. Um, but it is something you do need to be aware of. Uh, yeah. And not being aware of it is, is, I think, where most of the problem will come from. Fair enough. So another reason some people play games, I personally don't think this is me at all. Again, unless it's something more deep-seated than I realize, is it's a way uh, to establish pecking order. It's a way to show superiority. If you are good at games, you can beat the people around you. You can show that you are better at them at at least playing this game. And this is an aspect you'll see in highly competitive people, people who only care about winning the games to prove that they're better at the game and that they can win and that they've outsmarted you or outthought you or they've they've beaten you. And we all we all probably know an alpha gamer or two who who fall into this. And again, there can be no, there there doesn't have to be anything wrong with being an alpha gamer. Correct. Um, there are a whole world of competitive sports and competitive leagues, even competitive game like gaming. Uh, Catan. You can go to tournaments for Catan, mm -hmm. and that's great. But you want to make sure that it doesn't affect the group, and that's where we go back into some of our older episodes about yeah. toxic gamers at the table and things. Yeah, we have an entire episode uh, spawned by Brian Kurtz, one of our patrons, who had his deep dive competition at the table. And I recommend listening to that for more thoughts on this. But now, not quite going to that far, one of the reasons I do enjoy playing games is that feeling of sport, that feeling of competition, that challenge. The the There, there is the, the challenge of trying to beat the other players. Now, to me, it's not a way to show them I'm better than them. That doesn't matter. And I've said it many, many times. I don't play to win, but I will always play Sorry, I, I don't care if I win or lose, but I will always play to win. And this is <laughs> this is one of those things where, uh, and, and this gets into the whole concept of the mind. Uh, and, you know. Yeah, if, is it a game? Is it a game? Uh, and again, because whether or not the challenge is there for you, I think is a lot of it. And, and you know, if, it, if there isn't any challenge to it, um, you know, I don't consider necessarily playing tic-tac-toe with, you know, my 10-year-old son especially challenging uh that may or may not that that may not really be a game anymore yep. um but uh you know it was a game when i was trying to figure out how to make sure it wasn't me crushing them in three moves straight right uh and now it's just making sure we get the cats game every time uh yeah. so you know there's that but then if i play my son in chess uh, he's going to kick my butt because he likes chess. And uh, we actually just got a new uh, wizarding ch uh, chess board for his birthday. Mm -hmm. So uh, he, he needs me to sit down with him. And uh, I need to struggle because I am not a good chess player. Uh, yeah. And he loves it. 
That's uh, you might need to find some kind of digital opponent for him at that well, point. Well, that's that's the problem. Uh, we right? got him on on one of the chess trainer apps on the iPod yeah. on the iPad, and and that's how we got to be a good chess player. Mm -hmm. uh. No, totally fair. But yeah, the actual the the sense of a challenge, right? And that also applies to that's that's why puzzle games are so popular right is is that challenge of solving the puzzle so that's totally removes the social aspect if you're playing it solo right so the exit games or a lot of the solo games almost every solo mode in almost every board game is honestly a puzzle it, it, it's trying to optimize your moves to do something because you don't have the elements of other players changing things right so it's 99 percent of the time unless it's a completely random game and then it's push your luck that's that's about the only other way it goes so there's that sense of challenge then there's some people that really dig confrontation. They like to get in other people's faces. They like that us versus them, me versus the world. They enjoy um, confrontational based games where it's player versus player, whether that be a two player dueling card game like Magic or a full on war game with miniatures or any of that. Some people are in it for that confrontation, for that 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 i don't know what it is if it's the adrenaline it brings or the testosterone i don't know i'm not someone that enjoys confrontation in my games i will play games that are player versus player with confrontation but if it gets to that heated in your face i'm gonna kick your butt level i'm no longer having fun i don't enjoy that aspect of gaming yeah i'm not a pvp gamer um in any sense uh, of the word i think this this is uh, there's a lot of shared qualities and overlap with the alpha gamer uh, yeah. discussed earlier. Uh, you know these are 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 what were formerly considered jocks. Uh, the you know they 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 are there for the competition and whether or not they're you know maybe they can't they, they don't want to throw a football they want to do it on an 18xx instead um, mm -hmm. that exists for them and that's a co totally valid way to play a game. Again though you just need to make sure that the right people are playing with the right people and yes. no one is being you know, harmed or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, physically or mentally. Yeah. So the, uh, basically the crib notes from our competition episode is if you're running that game night, you put those people together, you find the two people who like confrontation and you let them go at it. Absolutely. That's pretty much it. So another thing too is, um, geek cred matters to some people. Like, um, they, they play certain games to be able to say they play those games. Uh, it's not something I've ever quite understood, but it's definitely, it's, it's a thing that people do. Like people are like, oh, I'm an 18xx gamer. I'm, I'm a better gamer than you are. I personally think that's kind of BS. I, I think anyone who plays any games can be considered a gamer. Even if your favorite game's Candyland, I'll admit you're still a gamer. I probably show you something better you might enjoy more, but all, all the power to you. I, I don't really believe in Greek cred. I'm not going to take away your Katana card because you don't play Katana. You know, it's... Not my thing, but it is a reason people play certain specific games or Absolutely. styles of games or types yep. of games. And I think the, the whole concept of geek cred is is kind of frustrating. Uh, it gets, I, I think there's uh, a level of misogyny involved in the geek cred concept. Uh, it's yeah. why you get a lot of girl gamers being, uh, you know, treated like trash online. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of the gamer gate aspect is related to the entire the basic concept of geek cred um whereas you shouldn't have it um it should be you know yeah it's it's a game i who cares yeah <laughs> i uh, there, there's so many aspects of it too right like there's a the the i could claim i own a lot of games does that give me more geek cred right we said that just our last episode we were talking about game collections and curating and like i don't care if you have a thousand games or you have 10 games you're still a gamer to me yep so another one too is uh, the feeling of power. Like you, you win, you feel powerful. You're winning, especially if you got like your army building, right? Like for some reason, I think feeling powerful, I think like Warhammer 40K. I'm stomping across the battlefield. I'm kicking butt. Um, another one though, that's I think even more important that is actually a um, deep seated thing in a lot of people is board games let you feel like you're in control because what you're doing in a board game is you are playing a very scripted play experience. You are confined to a very specific sandbox of you are walled in by the rules of the game. And because of that, nothing outside the box can happen, right? Like it's, this is where board games to me have an advantage over role-playing games for many gamers is the fact that you are in complete control. Everyone at the playable is playing by the same rules and every outcome that happens is expected in some way. Some may be less, uh, 
the probabilities may be less that some things happen and the probabilities may be more for more, but there's only a set number of possible outcomes from that game. And that is great for people who feel they need to be in control. Absolutely. And, and there's, um, there's some, some interesting uh, aspects, uh, and I think this goes into, and, and we, we talked about in the, suge in the comments earlier, uh, randomness in games. Yep. And one of the reasons why gamers, uh, as a class of people, um, whether you like the term or not, tend to downvote the, the randomness in games is because it, they no longer have that control. Right. The, 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 the gamer uh, sort of framework... Uh, what people think of as those gamer people um, tend to like the control aspect. They like the ability to know that if they plan everything out perfectly, that they're going to see a benefit from that. And the randomness uh, throws that off, right? They, they can't have that concept of chess, you know, understanding mm -hmm. 47 moves ahead. Yeah, which is something we're actually going to mention in one of our reviews later, mm -hmm. which I think is going to appeal to two different types of gamers because of the randomness factor. But speaking of randomness, what that does add to games, and this is something that, that I think I have to agree with, even though it's not, I'm not someone who usually loves highly random games, but what random elements can add is that, that feeling of chance, right? That thrill. That, that the die is about to fall, and if I roll a six, I win the game, and if I roll anything else, Sean wins the game, and did I get my six, right? That that whole thrill, the, this is the, the feeling that drives games like Can't Stop or any of the push-your-luck games where you're just like, oh, do I flip one more card in Dead Man's Draw or not? And if I do, do I lose everything, right? There is definitely a thrill that can happen playing games, and you always recognize those games at a game night because they're loud. People get excited. People are, are standing up. They're leaning over the table. They're waiting for that thing to happen and see what's next. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's actually one of the things I'm really finding enjoyable about uh, Rallyman GT on uh, BGA right now is, uh, you know, the first time we played it, none of us had a clue what we were doing. The <laughs> second time uh, I had watched the, the rule, the rules, um, the rules video mm -hmm. and stomped on everybody because they hadn't, they were, they had figured wow. out some things, but not figured out everything. Uh, and I stomped ahead and then we just started our third game and, uh, between people knowing the rules and someone having a bad role, mm -hmm. the entire squad got completely benched up and it threw off everybody's game. And it's one of those things where if we were sitting around a table at the FLGS, and had seen what had happened, you know, this person would have stopped a, in the curve, curve, yeah. and, and, and then this next person came in and wiped out in the only other lane yeah. as the first That would have been an everyone Everyone would have been, up, up, uh, you know, yeah. up, and, up and going at it. And, it's, and those it's, are the great moments, right? Yeah. Like, I, I, I'm calling it the thrill. I don't know what you call that, but the, those the people play it for the experience, I guess. Yeah. So one of the reasons people play board games are for those hell yeah moments those those pitch, pitch cars, actually to be example. honest <laughs> yeah pitch car one that one time when i flicked on the ramp and it literally stopped halfway up the ramp and just hung there like i've got a picture of that and it looks like a freeze frame of a jump but it's not it's my my pog or whatever yep. my crokinole piece is sitting there but i think that's another one that, that i didn't have in the notes here it's for experiences so people play games for experiences and that experience is going to be different depending on what game you're playing so people are going to play something like Nyctophobia, a game that is literally designed to make you feel scared and, and creeped out because you play blind and you are playing with your fingers and people are touching you. That's going to weird out most people and really not be for other people. And it invokes an experience that you're probably not going to get another way, especially not safely. There might be other ways to have that experience, like putting your hand in the box, which Sean will never do. Actually, I'm thinking Nyctophobia is not going to be a game he's ever going to want to yeah, try. There's no box, but it's that same doesn't aspect. doesn't really sound like uh, one of yeah. my go-tos. Yeah, that's the same aspect, right? Uh, but then there's, there's the push your luck games, right? The can't stops where, where yep. you manage to make a, a row seven in one turn yep. or whatever number. You make a seven in one, one just series of rolls. Or the game of 18xx where you end up bankrupting four other companies in the last turn of the game and buying them out and becoming like their your richest you've ever riched shows how much i know about 18xx's <laughs> but i'm just trying to think of like a broad range of experiences so i think a lot of people do play games for experiences and i think one of the things i personally do is this is why i played a lot of different games is to have different experiences at the table which to me, again, is goes back to the social aspect, and this is something we hadn't mentioned again, is games create a so shared social experience, something that can be 
and often will be talked about time and again, yep. so especially those big moments, right? You are creating a shared experience with someone that's just as memorable as that great birthday party or that graduation party. It's the, do you remember the time we were playing this and happened? And that's one of the great things about uh, live plays and actual plays on Twitch is, you know, we can share, you know, you, uh, you and you guys and Kator are playing Gloomhaven on Friday nights or were, uh, sure. both <laughs> pre pandemic. Uh, but you know, and when that's happening, there can be another community, uh, with Timujin and myself and tech mm -hmm. and whoever else is in the chat room experiencing that with you and can mm -hmm. then later on, Hey, remember that awesome when, Oh, it, it, you know, yeah. you got stuck in the doorway and ruined the entire thing. Cause nobody could move. Cause you were, you know, whatever, but yep. you know, there, there's that, there's that community that has evolved, even though there's only four people playing the game in a room, um, a bigger community has come up around that board yes. gaming. And that's, that's and then, the sort of power that board gaming can bring. Yes. Now, this is more of a role-playing game thing, but also with campaign games like uh, Gloomhaven, you have the shared social experience with everyone else who's played that scenario. Because, or played that character. What you see in Gloomhaven more often, people discussing how they built their character. How'd you do it? How'd you, what'd you what do with your, your What was in your deck? What was in your deck, right? Yeah. That That's even more common. But there's also Plane of Night is a famous one. We failed three times before finally beating it. It is now our most commented on. And if you added up all four views of those, it's probably as high as the damn FAQ. But people have commented on different ones, and it's always someone like, oh, Plane of Night, I remember that one. So Plane of Night for Gloomhaven is the Tomb of Horrors of Gloomhaven. It's it's the 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 mission that everyone's played, everyone likes to talk about. Yep. No, absolutely. And, uh, you know, Deanna's mentioning, you know, filling the board in Terraforming Mars uh, is one of those, yeah. oh, my God, I can't believe we actually did this moments. So... At this point, these are the ones I've got down, plus a couple extra we thought of. Do you have any others you can think of? I'm sure there are ones we've missed. No, we're going to we'll head over to the lobby, and we'll see if the awesome folk gathered there have anything to add in this discussion on why they play board games, because they probably don't know why we play board games. Well, <laughs> they know now. <laughs> All right. All right. So yeah, what we want to know tonight, uh, for everyone that's there now, there has been quite a bit going by and I, particularly there's a, a one from Deanna there. I would like to read off at some point you can read off is I want to know why you play games. Every, everyone who's in the chat, why do you play board games? Why do you play Or if you don't play board games, play RPGs, that's fine. We'll, we'll take both. Uh, what are reasons we missed? Like, have, did we catch everything? So it's so, so like, uh, Pennywise mentions, you know, I used to play sports. I don't need that competitive aspect in board games. He wants Fair. to enjoy himself and have fun. Yeah, no, I get that. And that's one that like, we kind of mentioned it's for social, but I have friends. The only reason they play board games is to hang out with their friends. Yep. They are not there to play the game. Actually, that was role-playing. It wasn't board games, but they are not there to play the game. They're just there because we're all together and it's awesome and we're all hanging out and it's great. Like, that's it. That's all they care. And as a DM, I recognize that. So that player just, you know, rolls attack dice now and then. And I don't rely on anything. I'll never give them an important plot point because that's their enjoyment of the game is to hang out with everyone else. And the same is true of board games. And I know there's people at the local game store who that's it. You know, they happen to wander in. They're like, oh, you guys are playing games. I'll play games. But really, they're there just to be with people. Yep. Uh, now, as we were talking about the geek cred and, and mentioning the misogyny involved, uh, D spoke up in the chat room, and I'm just going to read off her statement. Yeah. So, okay, as a female going deep here, I think I feel like if I can kick your butt or at least play uh, or at least play intelligently competitively, I've earned my spot at the table, and certain types of folk need to shut their stupid gobs. That's yeah. part of why I like to play competitively. And anyone who has played with NG Games knows competitively maybe a little of an understatement. She just kicks all <laughs> her butts. Uh <laughs> Well, she's not competitive. She plays competitively. Like yeah. she's not in your face about it. No, absolutely. It's not, not. confrontational. I've never, I'm never, I'm never going to feel, uh, you know, like she's lording it over anybody. Exactly. But we all know that she's probably going to win the game, and that's a part of the fun. And that's part of the fun. It's like playing with Charles is another one yes. where the 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 fact that I beat Charles in a game is a Windsor cred thing. I mean, that's yes, that's the is. kind of interesting cred. Uh, that I find that there's our geek cred. So there's good geek cred. Yeah, I yeah. beat Charles. I yeah, guess. I, it's I, bragging I, rights. There, we didn't have that bragging rights, I think, is better than the, what we called it earlier. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, uh, Evil John says he is the world's worst Catan player. I don't know, John. Might have to play on that one. I'm, I'm not a Catan <laughs> uh, player myself. So, there we go. 
So, uh, so Deanna does point out she likes to kick ass. That's a reason she plays games. Yeah, she enjoys that feeling of victory of of uh, asserting her ability to play. Absolutely. Uh, Pennywise also saying, you know, he, he's a chaos player. He doesn't care about winning. He just wants to try all the strategies. And there if he go. wins, it's just a bonus. Uh, that's actually a lot of what happens uh, and why we, the group are, uh, we play with on BGA plays together. Uh, yeah. None of us could even tell you what our ELO ratings are on any of the games. Um, every once in a while, I'll accidentally forget when I'm, forget who I'm talking to and joke with Eric about, oh, you're going to kick me out of the game because I just won can't stop like four times in a row. Um, and he's, he care quick to remind me, he's like, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. You know, none of us care if we win or lose. We're just there to play the games mm -hmm. as much as possible, basically. Uh, so people know he stops the brain from getting rusty. So again, it's, it's definitely a mental, yeah, yeah. mental exercise. Absolutely. Time, time. Yeah, friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I saw some stuff. I'm trying to find it. My bad. <laughs> yeah, we've had a, we've had a very active chat tonight. So yeah, we're, so it's uh, taking a bit sure. to scroll back. Um, a lot of people complaining about alpha gamers and avoiding them. Again, I am not going to complain and say these people are horrible, terrible nope. people you shouldn't game with. Everyone, ways of gaming are generally valid as long as they don't hurt anyone else. Now, I'm also not excusing terribly bad behavior, but get a bunch of alpha gamers and group them together if you can. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like if, if you host game nights, there are groups that that are right for everyone there is that type of player that is going to enjoy playing with that same type of player unless the person's only there to to show off and beat everyone else but then there's your problem player you don't want to game with yeah there's a difference between the alpha gamer and the problem player they may yes. overlap but they don't have to an alpha gamer can be a perfectly fine player at your table yep so then uh red meeple ryan notes they try to be welcoming but also play play to play and win if possible. I personally, I don't like one of the things I do not like, and I don't know where this falls. I don't see, I don't get it. And I think that's why I don't like it is the people who play to so chaos. I don't know what that is. I don't know what mental thing that is in their head. They're the, they're the people who play thieves and role-playing games to steal from the party and think that's hilarious or who show up to the game of Catan and build all around the desert and on the ones and twos. Cause ha ha ha, I'm not going to get resources. Like I don't get it. Like my brain does not work that way. So I don't know where that falls into what they're getting out of it. it annoying the other players. Like all I can think of is it's, it's trying it's, to attention. It's, it's troll, but it's troll behavior. Uh, it's yeah. the same people who are going out into the, the chat rooms and things and, and, you know, uh, taking the opposite point just to get people riled up. Um, yeah, so, it's, it's, so it's that's... generally, it's, it's an, it's a negative, it's a negative aspect and mm. it's mostly an attention seeking, uh, behavior as far as I know it. Again, we don't, yeah. we aren't psychologists and don't play them on TV. <laughs> yes. Again, we, uh, we, we but may not. to the best of my knowledge, it's attention getting behavior. So, so yes, I got Some people seem to play games to stir sh shite. That's probably as bad as the other word. I was uh, gonna say. We'll, we'll allow it. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to, to change it to, to stir up garbage and, and that seems to be their thing. I don't know. I, yeah. I guess it's attention getting. So Roger, here we go. We have someone who plays for the challenge. Yep. So we have someone in the chat room who literally plays the game for the challenge for the, 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 the winning. Uh, also the interaction, which is great. Um, Roger had to yell that at us. So that was important. Um, <laughs> In in it for the stories you can take from them. So there you go. There's there's that experience. And it for the so Animal Leslie says they're in it for the the experience, the the stories you can take home, the the the, enjoy, the enjoyment of the game. Yeah. Um. Going back to the chaos comment, just because I was looking at something else. I play orcs, so you want to talk true chaos. They're not they're not spiky and evil, but you want to talk about chaos on the table. Try playing orcs. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and Roger says, my wife and I are very competitive, but we always make up. Well, there yep. you go. So that's, that's yeah, the way Dan it's got to be. and I are pretty good right? at that one. Yep. Uh, Evil John, social deductions games light up a different part of his brain. So that's interesting. Yep. Social deduction parts light up a, a no, I don't want to play this kind of part of my brain. <laughs> Uh, custom backgrounds, role play story type stuff with boring gaming is awesome, which yep. is true. Like I, I do dig, like, that's why I love shadows over cam a lot that gets non role players to role play. Everyone yep. by the end of the game is like, Sir Belvedere, I will be there to help you. Like everyone gets into it, even if they never role played before. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, even, even with that unfortunate game we played of, uh, um, uh, yeah, we live streamed. I don't know what you're thinking of. So. Uh, Chinese uh, uh, hells of uh, 
Big Trouble in Little Big China. Big Trouble in Little China. Wow, yeah. Brain fart. Uh, you know, that's that's another great game where you can really jump in and, and play uh, play the characters. And it actually helps if you do, because the first time we played that game, we tried to play it like gamers uh, and got crushed yeah. because we weren't <laughs> playing like the characters, whereas that game is actually designed to play better if you are playing a little bit closer to those character types. So Ryan's got a, a longer one here. Games have become a combined social outlet and shared structural in, structured engagement. In time, I've become an enthusiast as engaged in conversations about around hobby gaming as much as playing the game itself. So that goes into our whole community, right? Sense yep. of community. Uh, I guess that's a reason to play games is to give you something to talk about. Um, gives you gives you a conversation, something to, that that. So here's another reason. People play board games because they they expand beyond the table. There's more to the game than what happens right then and there. The 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 talking about it after the fact, the going online to study strategies to improve, the playing on board game arena before playing with your friends again, or doing the I forget who it was, Gene Chu, I think, who was would purposely avoid all that so they didn't get better than their friends. All of those other aspects of gaming makes it a bigger experience than just the two hours of playing the game at the table. Yeah. Which there, I think is a good thing. There's so much more uh around a game. Like you can go out, buy a game, sit down, play it with your family, and that's it. Uh, yep. You pack it up at the end of the night and go away. And that's actually how I got into gaming. Like, why I I feel connected to games is because, as a child, uh, my family had a stack, you know, stacks of board games from mm -hmm. the 70s that we would pull out and play. Uh, and these were all basically rolling moves for the most part. Um, you know, Monopoly level-ish, or, you know, every once in a while there'd be a, a path-laying game. But... You know, it was something, it was a family experience uh, and generally a good one. We didn't have the Monopoly table flip, uh, you know, the mm -hmm. Monopoly table flip family type stuff. And so that really kind of gave the, the gaming a good start in my, in my life. So I think we're probably good now. There's still some chat going on. Please continue. Feel free to continue to discuss. But at this point, I think we're good for our main topic. Well, that's it for our main topic tonight. Remember, you can find lots of gaming topics and advice like this over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on gaming advice at the top of the page. And finally, if you've got a game or game night question for us, it doesn't have to be as deep as this one. Just head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or send us an email, questions at tabletopbellhop.com. <laughs> Up next, a look at Katana, Samurai Action Card Game, a two-player card game of Samurai Dueling. Please note the designer and publisher of Katana provided us with a review copy of this game. No other compensation was provided. All right, Katana was designed and self-published by Tracy Allen. It was originally funded through Kickstarter back in 2019. Uh, this game only plays two people, two people only, no solo mode, no three players. And a single duel between two samurai takes under 30 minutes. Well, we recorded an unboxing video of Katana, and that's a great way to check out what you get with this card game. For those of you who haven't had a chance to watch the video, how about a quick summary of what you get? Well, the game itself is in that kind of box you expect mass market card games to come in, like like the box for something like Uno. It's a super tightly packed box with a set of instructions and two piles of cards. Now, in addition to this box, I also received a separate example of play booklet and some tokens from Tracy. Now, from what I understand, this is something you'll get directly if you order directly from Tracy's website, which is katanacardgame.com, all one word, which as far as I can tell is the only way to get the game right now because it's not listed on Amazon or anywhere else. Now, they do mention the tokens on the website uh, once you go into the sale portion uh, as an exclusive uh, for the website, but the example of Playbook Knit isn't actually mentioned anywhere on their website. So, no. I don't know. No clue. Now, as for the cards, uh, these are nice, like really nice. These are high end cards. Like if these, like the best decks you can buy from B Bicycle, like they they are playing card quality with that whole plastic linen finish you can see on them, so they don't slide everywhere. And then the graphic design of these cards is fantastic. Like this is just a striking looking game. It is visually striking, and I got to say, I personally think it looks great. 
Now, my one big complaint with the components is that I got this extra stuff, right? And it's a tightly fitting box. So this extra stuff doesn't fit in the box. So there's nowhere to put this extra book or these tokens. So like at this point, I, I'm thinking like this is going to go in a quiver or something because it drives me nuts that I can't put it all in one spot. So now that we have an idea of what you get, how does Katana play? All right. So to start, each player is going to get a hand of three random kami. Kami are like Japanese spirits, not quite gods, not quite demons, like spirits, something like that. They're going to select one of these and put it into play. Um, this is the spirit that's like guiding your samurai or guarding your samurai. Each kami has a, a bunch of stats. So they have like a kamikaze value that you can use when you sacrifice the kami. They have a health and armor setup, which is a little odd. And then they have two abilities. They, each one has a passive ability and an active ability, and they're all 100% unique. You won't find the same passive ability or an active ability on a different card. So cards are, are filling multiple uses depending on how and when you use them. Yeah, this is true for the, the Kami and the combat cards, which are the ones which are going to be used for attack because your combat cards also have your attack defense and your stance on them, but more about that in a bit. So once you've got your Kami, you then have to set up your health, which sounds kind of weird, but you're putting down heart cards and then armor cards on top of those heart cards based on a pattern that's on your Kami. And each of these is unique again. And what matters is you can only attack the stack that's in the front. So the actual physical position of cards on the table matters. Yes, exactly. For for health and armor. Though I got to say, it does, doesn't seem to have as much impact as you'd expect while playing. Like the, the health pattern is set by your kami, but then the armor you can stack however you like, which is something that, that actually isn't totally obvious in the rules. But you can do some things where you, like, you stack it all in one spot seem to make a difference because it kind of makes like a, a roadblock for the other player to get by. So they kind of have to like make a really big attack to get past that part. But other than that, it doesn't seem to have too much. Now, each turn of the game, whoever's turn is going to draw five cards and they're going to pick one action out of a set of actions. These include activating your Kami. You have to play a Purify card from your hand to do that. Initiating Kamikaze, which is a massive attack, but it burns your Kami. Polluting your opponent's Kami with a Pollute card from your hand. Just drawing a Shrine card or discarding cards to draw new cards. Discard as many as you want to draw new cards, but it takes your whole turn. Or actually attacking. Now, those kami I talked about each earlier each have two powers, right? The active power can only be used by playing a Purify card. They also have a passive power all the time. Now, all these powers break the rules in some way. I'm not going to get into how, but there's lots of different ways they break the rules. And you can lose these powers if your kami becomes polluted. The first time your kami is polluted, it loses the active ability. The second time it becomes polluted, you lose the passive ability. And if a kami ever becomes polluted three times, it's actually removed from the game. Now, a player without a Kami can get a new one. They just have to discard a Purify card and lose one armor to draw a new Kami. And all that pollution can be removed by playing Purify cards on your turn. Now, every time you do Pollute or Purify, you have to draw a Shrine card. And these are an interesting mix of Banes and Boons with the deck weighing slightly towards favorable things. So that is a lot to take in for a game that's only 108 cards. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, it's like, I would say it's less cards than that because so many of the cards are the same, which we'll get to in just a second because the attack cards, of which they're the combat cards, which is the majority of the decks, are only actually four different types. And every one features an attack value, a defense value, and a stance on the bottom. And more about stances in a second. So the attacker is going to play a card saying, I attack with this, with whatever value it is. It's either one, two, or three. And then the defender can play one card in defense, which again is one, two, or three. If the defending player's defense is greater than the attack, the attack's prevented. If it's less, the difference is taken as damage. Damage is applied first to armor and then to health. Well, that's straightforward enough. Big numbers beat small. Armor takes damage before people do. Yep, pretty much. Now, what's interesting is one attack is actually like a series of blows. So after that first play of a card, and if it's defended, the attacker can keep playing cards. And they can just keep attacking, 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 as long as they have cards in their hand. And then the defender is going to try to defend, defend, defend for all the cards they have in their hand. Until either the attacker stops or a point of damage is actually dealt 
once damage is dealt, the, the series of blows stops. So it's you picture that samurai duel of the, the, the quick exchange of blows and then step back and look at each other again. I thought this was really interesting. And the other thing is if you hit the opponent's health, you've drawn blood. And at that point, the, the combat pauses. And then as a nice thematic touch, the player has to pollute their kami for drawing blood because in feudal Japan, blood was considered to be a polluting element. So the one thing I think we can say about this game is that it is thematic. Now, I don't even begin to sort of be any expert no. on samurai martial history, but the feeling and concepts they're working with just really give you a, an immersive feeling, at least to this old white guy. And I got to say, every interview I have seen with Tracy Allen is he has done his research. Like he, he has, he is basing this on some form of Japanese uh, history and mysticism. I don't know it myself again, but he does seem to have done the research. To me, it definitely has that feel of a, a Kurosawa movie, or at least the, what I think of when I think of samurai culture. Right. Now, instead of playing a combat card to attack, you can also go kamikaze. I mentioned this before. Every kami has a kamikaze value. It's usually huge. It's like six, seven attack. You do it. You make your big attack. And then your kami's burnt and gone. So a truly sacrificial attack. Now, once the player has taken an action, you then get a chance to take one of the cards in your hand and put it face down. This is now your stance for the next round. I said I'd get back to stances. Now, stance cards go off if your opponent attacks you. What's interesting is that they don't, you just burnt that card. It was a waste. But if they do attack you, you're going to flip the stance. There are four different stances. They do different things. Ones give defensive bonuses, another retaliates and so on. I'm not going to get into the details here. Right. So you're guessing what your opponent will do in advance to try yeah. and minimize their success success at whatever it exactly is there. yep so play continues back and forth until one of the players loses their last health heart causing the other player to win pretty simple now what's interesting to know here that may not have been obvious from this description is you only get to draw new cards at the start of your turn so a big part of the game is trying to decide how to balance the cards you have like how many cards because if you spend you have five cards you spend three to attack that's only going to leave you one for a stance you only got one card left to defend with then because of the standard way of play. So that's that's a big part of the game, is if you go for that big attack, you're probably leaving yourself open. But the best thing overall, I gotta say, the, the best thing about this game is the way it looks. Like, I don't know, there's just something striking about this game. And every time I share a picture with it online, I'm not the only one. Like, I get comments from people like, oh, what game's that? What's that? How's that play? Have you done a review yet? Like, everyone is excited by this game. Like, there's just, like, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's Art Deco or whatever that style is, that look, that it only uses four colors. Like, it just bang like this game just looks so good yeah and you, you're adding the quality of the art and the overall aesthetic to the actual component quality you mentioned earlier and you've got a really strong offering when you open up that box yeah it is it's really impressive now the other thing i like is what we already basically mentioned is how well the theme is tied into this game. Like you get that feel, you get this samurai who's being guided by a kami. He's, he's invoking the spirits there are the way actions are taken the way you can set up for a big attack and then that attack being a series of different strikes and counter strikes either ending with a failed attack or the drawing of blood like, like i said kurosawa like i just i picture those the the samurai circling each other the bang 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 and then looking at each other again and bang 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 and then you know the the scene where the guys from behind and then you see him bleeding like i totally see that while playing this game and then there's that whole uh concept of corruption and pollution which i found really fascinating yeah, and what I get is that that, that sense of uh, the concept of mindfulness uh, is what I think of when listening to this talk of the actions and the planning and those short, decisive interactions with an opponent before you break away yeah. and, and reset, um, which is, again, a, a very uh, sort of uh, theme for, themed for that, that whole concept. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh that's it for the roses. I got to say this, th there is a serious problem with this game though. And that is the rules. Um, in addition to the fact you have a rule book that comes with the game. I also got this added example guide that the designer thought was necessary for learning the game. And I got to say, if I sat down and if I was the kind of gamer who only played by the rules as written, I probably would have given up. Like, I don't even know if I could have finished a game because every time, we sat down to play Katana, something would come up that isn't covered by either of the books. And then 
with the two books, there were rules that were contradictory between the two. And then things that were only found in one, not the other. So things that were only in the example book that weren't in the rule book and things that I, it literally, I got to say, I'm sorry to say the game is unplayable as written. If you follow the rules in the example book only, if that was your only source of knowledge. And also, this isn't a limited reaction to the game. Numerous content uh, commenters and reviewers have indicated that they have needed to rely on Tracy to understand the game yeah. uh, in order to when you know the, the Kickstarter people who received the Kickstarter uh, have indicated that Tracy was really helpful again and again with problems they had with the game, and and basically that's saying that they couldn't play the game without his help. Yeah. Um, and it's great that they're available to do that. All the respect in the world to Tracy for that, but it is also unfortunate that that's required. Yeah, so now I, I do have to say, if I bought this at Target, say, and I didn't have the bonus book and I brought it home, any pair of gamers with any amount of experience of playing games is going to be able to, to play it in some way. You'll be able to muddle through. You'll be able to come up with rulings for various situations that come up that aren't covered by the rules, right? We're all gamers. We've all seen it before. You can interpret it. You're like, oh, do you think this stance means I get a bonus armor now? Or I get both the bonus armor and the plus the defense. You're going to decide, well, one or the other. And one's going to be right. And one's going to be wrong. And But you're going to get to play the game. You'll be able to extrapolate what's there. Like, come on. We were able to sit down with our group and we played the He-Man Master of the Universe role-playing game. It is possible, despite the fact the rules aren't as good as they should be. Now, I am pleased to say that the designer, Tracy Allen, has put up an official Katana FAQ on Board Game Geek now. And many of the questions that I contacted him with were put on that post, which is awesome. So he is taking that step to be able to, to get that information out there. So it's, it's good that it's getting out there, but and, and no, the game's not unplayable. I just think it's unplayable as written. Right, and it is an excellent design that design the uh, sign that the designer is willing to accept potential issues and take action to rectify them. Too often, games are released into the wild on their own to flourish or die, as you know, as the wind may have it. Now, ignoring the issues with the rule book, uh, having sat down with Tracy, asked questions, figuring out how to play, I would say it's decent. Um, I love the theme. I love the aesthetic. The look of the game is great. There are aspects that work really well. Like the, the hand management aspect, uh, I love that. Do I spend all my cards to attack or do I hold some back to defend? That is a great decision point in a game. But then there's other parts that just felt like they could use more work. Uh, as I already mentioned, the armor health system, like seems like it's neat in concept, but it just feels like there, there should be a bit more there or something. And then I, pollution just seems a little overpowering. Like you just get polluted. And um, one of the things that can happen is once you've lost your kami, your opponent can just keep piling pollution on you. And you can't get a new kami until all that's gone. Like things like that, just pollution seems a little overpowered. Like maybe there should be more purified cards than pollution cards. Uh, there's just a few things that, that felt like they could have used a, a little more work. And personally, this is a two-player dueling game. This is one of those games you sit down with a deck of cards and you're competing with the person across from you. And there are a lot of those out there. There are a lot of two-player dueling games. And I own quite a few in my collection. And personally, compared to most of the other games, this just seems very light. And that's due to the lack of variety in the cards. Like when I try to compare this to Star Realms or Sorcerer or Ashes, uh, Rise of the Phoenix Born, like th there's no comparison in a way like the card options are severely limited to compared to even like a magic, the gathering. If you think of all the magic cards, like there are literally only four different combat cards in this deck. And this is obviously by design. Like this was intended. This isn't trying to compete with star realms, but limiting the cards uh, it, while it gives you a tighter tactical game, right? You know, what's there, you know, what's going to come out, you know, the possibilities and you even know the probabilities of those possibilities you're playing a game that's more like chess, right? That, that you know the, the different moves your opponent can make. While I like chess, I prefer my card games to feel more like Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Like I want lots of options and variability. So I can see it. I can see some gamers being on either side of the fence. There's going to be people out here who prefer the, the tactical, more tactical games will probably enjoy the limited card set. But personally, I found it not, not limiting, but boring. Right. Simplicity is definitely one of its selling points uh, and part of its theme. 
Uh, it seems like this could be a real carry with you and play when you've got some time to kill sort of game once it gets past the rule hurdles, if you're into that sort of, you know, that tight yeah. little tactical game. Now, overall, uh, once we had figured out the correct way to play, uh, Deanna and I had some fun playing with it. It wasn't a terrible experience. This is a decent game. It looks fantastic. Though in the end, I I just feels like it could use a bit more polish. Like I, it, To me, it felt like this game could have used some rounds of blind play testing. I think that would have surely helped with the rule book as well as fine honing some of the gameplay elements. As for anyone curious about picking this one up, I would suggest checking out the reviews that are out there. I would suggest checking out a few of them. Like, obviously, you've already listened to ours. But check out what other people had to say. Look at the reviews on Board Game Geek. Um, there are a few video reviews out there where you can see people playing. Uh, in a way, like, see if this looks like the kind of game for you beforehand. But most importantly, if you do pick this up, do take the time to go to Board Game Geek and find that FAQ. It is an absolute must in this case. Well, for a more in-depth look at Katana, you can head over to cable, tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. Up next, a look at Jaws, the board game, a one-verse minigame from Ravensburger. Ravensburger was awesome enough to send us a review copy of Jaws, but no other compensation was provided. All right, Jaws was designed by Prospero Hall. Uh, published by Ravensburger in 2019, plays two to four players. Full game takes a bit over an hour, uh, but is very dependent on how much discussion happens on the main character player side of things. Yeah. So to get a good look at the excellent components you get in a shiny new copy of Jaws, be sure to check out our unboxing video. Now, the components are really nice, as Sean said. They, they are excellent components. There are some great meeple, including a fantastic sharp meeple. Uh, there's little boats that actually fit the meeple in them. Uh, there's a number of cards. There's a nice compact two-sided board that I think would be great for, like, a coffee shop or a diner. Um, some other tokens and bits. Like, I, I honestly have no component complaints at all about the components in this game yeah definitely solid materials ravensburger has really been on point when it comes to components in current releases uh though i do have to say what is with ravensburger calling meeples movers that just confuses me I, the same thing like horrified the, the minis they're called movers take your mover and move it here that was just weird it's yeah. got to be a translation thing or maybe maybe someone's tried to trademark meeple i don't think so mm. But, uh, well, how does one play this board game version of Jaws? All right. Well, in Jaws, one player takes on the role of the shark. The other players play Hooper, Brody, and Quint. Game of Jaws is broken into two acts with the results of the first act impacting the second. In the first act, characters are moving around the island trying to capture the shark, whereas act two, the shark is attempting to destroy the character's boat or eat them all. So much in keeping with the rough outline of the movie, Shark as hunter, and then shark as hunted. Now, the first part of the game is Act 1. Uh, it's Amity Island, which I have to assume is the island the movie takes place on. Uh, here, players playing the shark it attempts to eat as many swimmers as possible, while the characters try to attach two barrels to the shark and protect the swimmers. Each round starts off with an event, which mainly has players placing a number of swimmers at the beaches that are on the island and can include some additional rules that will impact the rest of the round. Then the shark acts followed by the characters. The shark gets three actions, which are either really simply eat a swimmer or move. In addition, though, the shark starts the game with four special abilities. They can use one of these each round. Now, these let the shark do things like eat extra swimmers, move extra spaces, or evade detection for the round. Now, all of these actions are taken in secret by the shark players. So this is one of those hidden movement games like Scotland Yard or uh, many other games. Uh, Spectre Ops is the other one I was trying to think of. And they do this using this shark tracker pad. And the only thing they have to tell the other players is how many swimmers they've eaten and where, not at what time, and if they trip any motion sensors, which are on the barrels, which we'll get to in a second. Now, and the shark pad is a real piece of paper, not a dry erase board, with more than enough sheets for any but the biggest fans of this yeah. game who plan to hand it down to their kids later in life. You may you may run a little short at that <laughs> point, but... I am sure there's probably somewhere online you can get more sheets. Yeah, absolutely. Too. All right, next, the Players Act. So 
Each character has their own set of actions. Some overlap, some don't. Uh, Quince, the pilot of the fishing boat, the Orca, uh, he's in the water around Amnity and can either move, rescue swimmers, pick up barrels, or launch barrels in the water. Launching barrels is, of course, important because if a launched barrel hits the shark, the shark meeple is placed on the board so everyone knows where it is, and the shark player takes the barrel and places it on their player board. Once the shark has two barrels, this act is over. Barrels that don't hit the shark, though, float in the water and act as motion detectors going forward. Now, Brody helps from the shore. Brody can move, rescue swimmers, pick up and drop off barrels, use the binoculars to try to spot the shark on a beach, or close one of the beaches. Closing beaches actually prevent swimmers from showing up there for a limited number of time. Hooper, the last character, pilots his speedboat around the island. Hooper can move, rescue swimmers, pick up barrels, give barrels to Quint and use a fish finder. Now the fish finder is used. The shark player has to tell the other players if they're in the square with the fish finder or in adjacent square to the fish finder or somewhere else. Right. So player positioning and cooperating cooperation is really important during these phases though. We should be, I should be aware it can lead to quarterbacking. If you've got one yes. of those players at the table. Yeah, this is definitely like you have the co-op aspect from the three players. The three characters are working together. And interesting enough, we play the game three player. They literally say each player chooses a character and then shares the third, which I don't think I've ever seen in a game like worded that way, like spelled yeah. out. So play continues. Uh, event, shark moving, players moving until either the shark has eaten nine swimmers or the characters have managed to attach two barrels to the shark. So honestly, I think this act one is where the game really shines, uh, as you will not be able to do everything you want as a player or as a team. And you really need to outthink the shark who needs to stay on their toes the whole time. Uh, and it, it really is a well-shaped, uh, you know, one versus many yep. game. So act two, the Orca. So at the start, uh, the shark's going to get a number of shark ability cards, so special abilities, and the characters are going to get a bunch of random equipment cards. And this is based on how well everyone did in the first half. Um, the board gets flipped over and you build a boat out of tiles. You're going to put your meeples on the boat, movers, sorry, your movers on the boat. And then what's going to happen here is you are going to flip over three cards from this deck called the resurface deck. And it shows three potential spots the shark could pop up and attack from. Now, the shark's going to take tokens, A, B, and C, and it's going to pick which of the three cards, basically, they're going to follow. And then the characters then get to move around on the boat, pick one of their weapons from their crew cards, and then put a target token going, I'm going to think the shark's going to show up here and I'm going to attack here. Uh, then there's additional crew cards they can spend too. Like there's chum, which lets the characters flip over another token. And there's like a shark cage that protects them. And there's a whole bunch of cards that modify this basic gameplay but the basic gameplay is shark decides where they're going to pop up characters try to guess where that is and hit the shark right again you do run into that potential for quarterbacking because it is a, a co-op team game especially if one player has played the game multiple times yeah. that they, there are some some sort of themes you can pick up that that will help newer players and so do watch for that so now that the characters know where they're attacking, the shark knows we're going to do it. They flip their thing up. You put the shark on the board, and then you resolve. So any crew that are targeting that spot get to make their attacks. Uh, this is used using specific uh, custom dice. They're really nice, like blood red dice with uh, little hit symbols on them. And assuming the shark isn't killed, it then gets to make an attack itself. Now the shark can either attack the bow or swimmers in the water. And honestly, the shark meeple is awesome. <laughs> Though I gotta say, Big G was playing the other day and pointed something out I totally missed. It has jaws on both sides, which is kind of creepy. <laughs> <laughs> it should have eyes on one of those sides or something. She was rather creeped out by that. So play continues like this. Uh, the shark pops up at different locations, the crew trying to guess where it is until either all the crew are dead, shark wins, the boat has completely sunk, shark wins, or the shark is dead, players win. In addition, there are rules for uh, playing just each part of the game separately, which is actually kind of solid because they are good enough. Like, like, to be honest, if this was 20 years ago, these would have been two separate games and people would have accepted it perfectly fine. You could have had Jaws Shark Attack and you could have had Jaws Save the Beach and sold them separately and people probably would have been perfectly happy with them. Yep, absolutely. Now, before I go into my final thoughts, I do need to state that I have never seen Jaws. 
which means I had no preconceived notions of what to expect from this game, except that there's a shark in it. And there's a quote about needing a bigger boat. That is pretty much the extent of my Jaws knowledge. And I had no clue what the two acts had to do with the movies. I, I had no strong feelings towards any of the characters. I don't know those three characters. I don't feel like that I care about one more than another. And one of the things that impressed me about this board game version of Jaws is that this didn't do anything to ruin the game for me. I didn't feel I was missing out on anything. Now, I will admit, I bet you if I knew and loved Jaws, I would have enjoyed the game more than I had. But it didn't do anything to ruin it by not knowing anything. Now, I have seen the movie multiple times, so I sat down to play this with preconceptions. Uh, now, I think that while unnecessary, there are more than enough connections to the movie to give fans that feeling that they're uh, looking for, that sort of yeah. connection to the game that makes them you, you think you're in that, that setting, essentially. Uh, now, while I don't think you're ever going to get that pit of your stomach horror feeling that you can get from the, the movie uh, if you're you know willing to dive into it, uh, I think it's still a solid representation of the movie. Fair. Totally fair. So overall, Jaws is a very solid one versus many board game. Uh, component quality is top notch. I found both acts to be fun. Uh, both, again, as I mentioned, are detailed enough that they could, be, could have been standalone games. And I think they did a great job of combining those two games. And... We have seen both the shark get caught very early and the shark get all nine swimmers and that not unduly affect the second half. Now, it did have an impact, but it didn't seem like uh, because the shark did so great at the beginning, they automatically won or anything like that. Uh, what I have find that's interesting, and I'm seeing this in the chat room tonight here on Twitch, is that different people seem to like different parts of the game. Like everyone seems to have their preference, right? So um, we have Pennywise preferred the first act, whereas Angie Games preferred the second half. So I, I think that's interesting. And I also find that people will switch which phase they prefer depending on which side they're on. So like people have enjoyed part one more as the shark, I've found most cases. Um, what I do see though, is everyone who plays the shark seems to prefer playing as the shark. Like not enough that, oh, I hate playing the characters, but like it does seem like... Um, if everyone's played this game before, you're going to have that, well, who gets to be the shark this time moment? Right. So I fall, at least, so I fall solidly on the first side, first act is a, better team. Yeah. Uh, with the opening act being more of an interesting game for me, but full disclosure, I've only played as the players. I never actually got a, uh, a turn as the shark. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair. It, like, you need to play the shark just so you can see it. Uh, honestly, I can't find anything to really fault about this game. Now, I will say, this isn't a game that I personally feel I want to play often. This just isn't one that I'm just, like, itching to play again. Now, maybe it's the fact that I have no personal ties to the license. Or maybe it's something to do with the gameplay. I don't know. Um, playing Jaws does feel like sitting down to play two different games when you play again that's not a bad thing but it's just like i could fit in two games of something else or i could play two different games instead of playing both parts of jaws and i like to me that's something i consider when trying to decide what to play on game night so i to me it really is a solid game with some great build quality some interesting mechanics and play and while i had a great time playing it uh playing it once as a human and I would try it again to play as the shark. I feel it was mostly a one and done for me other than that, uh, which is something I found disappointing because again, it's a really well-made game. Like mm -hmm. so they have clearly put so much effort into this game and I wish I wanted to play it more, but I just don't. Yeah. Now I got to say, if you are a fan of Jaws the movie and you're a board gamer, you got to try this somehow. Whether it's, whether it's you pick up a copy and, and, and play it for yourself or you try it out at the local game store, you borrow a friend's copy, go to the local gaming cafe. Like I honestly, if you are a Jaws fan, you got to try this game. Got to give it a shot. Now, if you're like me and haven't played Jaws, there's still a lot to like in this game, especially if you like that one versus many, the, the semi co-op game, right? The one team-based bunch of players working together against the, someone else. If you dig those, I think this is a solid example. Now, if you do get a chance to play, the thing I do strongly recommend is give the game a try from both sides. Try it once as the shark and once as the characters. Now, because the, the gameplay is different enough that I think you want to see it from both sides. Now, the problem is 
it takes a while to play both parts. And I don't think anyone's going to want to do it right then. Like if you've got a group of four players, you're not going to give everyone a turn as the shark in one game night. I just can't see playing four games of jaws in a row. So you almost need like two days, two chances to play the game. So you can, can spread it out. I I would actually say you almost need four chances because a lot of the time you're not going to find people who are going to want to play as the people again. If they've yeah. played as the people, they're going to want to play as the shark. So you need another new set of people to <laughs> play as the people Just to while try everyone's out, yeah. trying the shark. And and that's that's sort of why I think it falls flat for me. I You know, hey, I played it as the people. I loved it. Now I want to play as the shark, but I feel bad. I don't want you to have to play as the people again. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Well, for a more in-depth look at Jaws, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here, what games hit our tables. Uh, every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's been going on. So as we're already getting a little long tonight, I'm going to try to keep things a little briefer than usual. So the big thing that we did get to play this last week with Deanna and I is we decided to break out and tackle the Pathfinder Adventure card game, uh, specifically the 2019 core set, uh, which is something Paizo was cool enough to send a review copy of. This is a big one in more ways than one. Yes, totally agree. Now, I admit, I was intimidated by this game. I don't get intimidated by games. 18xxs intimidate me, and the Pathfinder Adventure card game intimidated me. And that is because of the depth and thick and and density of the rule book uh, and, and the language of it. Like, this thing reads like a technical manual more than a set of board game rules. And I got to say, it makes sense because I learned that this game is tied to an organized play system. There is a Pathfinder Society specifically for the card game. And because of that, this is one of those uh, on a uh, actual play actual plays wrong word organized play events where there's like prizes right like people play this competitively and i realized that because of that they need to write the rules to be as unambiguous as possible right so this what it made me think of is when we first got into magic the gathering with the little folded rule book that was in the in your your starter pack compared to just how detailed the rules are now especially when you get into timing and like there's a timing chart for magic well there's a timing chart for pathfinder right so 440 cards just in the core set is a lot of combinations and permutations to take it you know take into consideration Yeah, there's a lot of interactions there. And to be honest, it might be that those are 100% unique cards. I don't think we saw a single duplicate while playing. So it's not only that, because that is something they changed from the the original printing is they no longer give you six goblins in case you need six goblins. And Ked, you have these proxy cards. So you have one goblin card and you fill your deck with proxies Mm -hmm. to represent all the goblins. So I honestly think those might be 440 unique cards. Wow. Which is crazy. Yeah. So... In prep for our first game, I went online. I'm like, all right, show me the best 2019 Pathfinder Corset video. There isn't one. There, there is one out there, but it's someone's three hour long podcast where they talk about the game kind of in the middle of it. And then I admit, like, we have a pretty long show. I couldn't make it through it to get to the Pathfinder part. Uh, there is no just actual play for the 2019 version, but there are tons for the previous release, including like Rado does the original, the Rise of the Loon Lords base set. So I did watch those and that was useful to a point, uh, did help with the overall flow of the game, but there are significant changes in this version that meant we still had to spend a lot of time referencing the rules. Right now, to be fair, this isn't really Paizo's fault. Most game companies don't generate how-to videos, yeah. although some are starting to, thankfully. Uh, Ravensburger being one that uh, has been mm-hmm. linking some stuff in their boxes. Uh, I expect a lot of the fans who had earlier ad- games either didn't upgrade to the newer version or didn't feel like re-recording it when they did, especially since it's yeah. hard to separate your prior knowledge out, which is important for teaching newcomers. And a lot of the stuff were changes of terms where if you played the original, you probably just keep using the old term without impacting the new game. So I think a lot of people who played the game already aren't jumping in at this point, but I don't know, whatever it is. To be honest, I saw it as a potential opportunity. Not that we've done any actual like teaching videos that we've recorded, but here's one we might want to do because there's there's definitely a market out there, like which is hopefully more than just me. <laughs> 
So our first game, we did the tutorial because there's a sheet in the box that says, uh, read this first. So that's what we did. We read the box first. And what's nice is like you only use one of the packs of cards. And it's literally says open this first on the pack of cards. Of course, I had already opened it because I did an unboxing video. But I kept that deck together, thankfully. And we played through that. And I am glad we did because that really helped nail things down without any permanent impact on the campaign because this is a campaign game that's right folks they aren't kidding when they pop those read this first things into packaging do it now maybe if you played the original you might need, need to but I, I don't see why you wouldn't so with that learning game under our belts we went for the full game uh we actually did this over multiple nights we made new characters and we started the first adventure path known as the dragon's demand now i'm not going to get into details here but i will say character creation was way more involved than i expected like not like making a full rpg character or a full pathfinder character specifically but way more than i expected from a card game well that's nice to hear unless of course it's too involved for a card game no, I wouldn't say too involved. It's just there's a lot more choices than I expected with lots of options. Like uh, the different things you had to pay. All it is is deck building. You're just building a deck of 15 cards. But when you get to pick through all 440 cards to pick, that's a lot of options. Now, our first adventure together went really well. Uh, we got to see a lot more of the game and really got to explore our characters, which that was uh, another very striking aspect of the game was how different each character seems to play. And they give you a ton. I it's eight like you can only play the game with four players, but they give you like eight or twelve characters. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. There are a ridiculous number of characters in the box that that you don't necessarily need, I guess. But part of that's the replayability. Like once you play through the once you play through one adventure in the adventure path with that character, you can't do it again. So you could play through the entire thing with a new set of characters. Interesting. So I get that. Um, overall, I dig the game. I I will say. Uh, it was close, our game. Like, there's a there's a timer. There's a clock, literally called the clock, and it ticks down cards every turn. And we were on the last hour of the game. I did dig it. I did enjoy it. It is fiddly as heck. Like, it is. I, I Fiddly is probably the best way I can describe it. We were looking up things. There's keywords. There, the, this, it feels like Pathfinder, I, I will have to say. Um, pretty regular base. We were looking up stuff. But one thing I will say, we did find answers for every question we had. Uh to compare it, say, to a game we reviewed earlier today. It was all there. It was all in the book. Like, I, that is the one thing. Why that book is so thick is it tries to account for every possible combination and continuity and everything was there. Now, I enjoyed it. I got to say, Deanna was particularly smitten with the game. Like, she really liked it. Keeps talking about how much she liked it, how much she enjoyed it, what she liked about it. She's been going on about it since we played and pushing us to play more. So, definitely won her over. Well, I have to say, I've been eyeing the Steam version of this for a while, and you're certainly not doing anything to <laughs> douse my interest uh, in that. I, I I don't know. I don't know if I'd enjoy the Steam version as much. It, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know if it'd be as fun as having your deck. I, I well, couldn't tell you. Unfortunately, I don't really have the, the second player. Well, yes, there get into is that. that. So it's, it's Steam or nothing look at, for If you me can like play it multiplayer, it might be worth it. Yeah. So that's it for now on the Pathfinder Adventure Card Game. I do, I do need to do up a full review, and I haven't decided what I'm going to do. I might actually wait till we finish the full Adventure Path just to, to give the full experience or full thoughts. Or is that spoilery? I don't know. Like, I, I haven't decided what we need to do. I definitely need to play a couple more times. Um, the problem with finishing the Adventure Path is I only have the experience of one character. So I don't know if I need to try it with another one. Overall, though, uh, definitely digging it so far. So, uh, again, trying to keep things a little shorter. The other games we played this week are some of our favorite two-player games of all time. Uh, these are games we've talked about many times, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. First up was Onitama. Uh, this is a game that I need to break out more often because, man, was I terrible. Um, I, I just had to pay more attention. I lost three games in a row, all due to basically moving my sensei right where they could be attacked. So that wasn't very enjoyable no, we can't all be on all the time this is a world full of distractions especially yeah. during quarantine very true i don't know i was terrible at onitama just bad up next we broke out the duke um we used to talk about this all the time and it's been a while everyone uh, who's been a long time fan of the show knows i love this game and that fact still stands what's interesting is I, I don't know for sure, like because I, I don't. One of the things on Board Game Geek is you can't log if you played the the variants or not, right? So I don't know if this is the first time we ever used them, 
but it's the first time I remember using them is like, cause normally when we sit down to play, we just play with the basic rules. Like the, here's the map. There's nothing special on the map. Here's your two footmen, your Duke and the standard pieces in the bag and her bag, same as mine. And I don't know why I felt like it. I just felt like using more bits when we played the other night. So first off we broke out the mountain tile and this one's neat cause you randomly put it on the board. And what we did is we just took out a D six and rolled D six by D six and put it on the grid. And what happens is, you can't do anything with this. You can't move on to the spot. You can't jump over it. You can't trace an attack from it. The mountain's just blocking everything. Right. So that one doesn't come with the new version of the game. Really? Is that a promo or an expansion? It came in my box. It came oh. with the base game. Interesting. So it's something they they removed from the Lord's Edition. Which yeah, because we've got all the we've got all the Arthurian uh, aspects. See, I the have Lord's the Arthurian, Edition. but I had to buy it separate. Right. Uh, so uh, with the Arthurian, do you have the fort? Because it's on the back of Camelot. Uh, probably then. I, I, I we yeah, haven't, we haven't, have the we haven't broken out the Arthurian yet. So, so that was the other thing we did. So we played a couple games with the mountain, and then we broke out the fort, and we actually used both. And I, the fort was okay. So what the fort does is you can move on to it. Um, but you can't spawn a new troop next to it. Like if the Duke's next to it, you can't put someone instantly in the fort. And what it does is it protects you from strikes. So it's the, the burst attack where you just flip your guy and kill someone. It protects you from strikes, but you can strike out of it. And I don't know, like it, it didn't seem to have the impact the mountain did because we just didn't draw a lot of tiles with strikes. And I honestly think in the base set, there aren't a lot of tiles with strikes. Right. So I, I don't know that that one was okay. It, it was still interesting. Like it was, eh, it's different than the base game. So. Yeah, now I feel like I need to sit down with uh, my son and, and put those Ar Arthurian tiles in because we never have. Uh, we've only ever played with the, the base, the base uh, set, set. Yeah, I'll admit we were tempted. Like I was looking at the Robin Hood set and then I also have like the, the Conan set and then I also I, I have the Three Musketeers. Uh, is it, not Conan, sorry. It's um the Robert E. Howard set because Conan's one of the tiles and then there's um, a bunch of his other characters, Cull and um, Solomon Cain and one other of Howard's characters. And I didn't realize, I thought they were all just like throw them in the bag. They're not. Like Robin Hood, Robin Hood replaces, uh, you still keep your Duke, but Robin Hood is who you have to capture. So your Duke's still in your deck, but Robin Hood's the one that has to be captured. And then like Little John and Maid Marian that replace tiles. So you like pull out the Oracle and replace it with my Maid Marian, for example. But more interestingly is on the other side, you have three tiles. There was the Sheriff, King John, and someone else. I can't remember who. Sir Guy, I think. And if none of them are on the board, you lose. But if like two of them are on the board and you capture one, you still win. And then there's a hierarchy of ranks for who gets to be the Duke when you summon new characters. And I'm like, wow, that really changes the game. So we were curious to try those out. We didn't do it. So maybe <laughs> that's a that's a next thing, week thing. Right. And that's it. Uh, actually, to be honest, we also played some Jaws with my daughter, but we talked about Jaws plenty. So how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? All right, so like we're having a big party tonight for 100 episode, right? Well, next week is our two year anniversary. Uh, it's going to be an AMA again. We're looking. I'm, I'm hoping to get some like podcasting questions or something. Like, come on, tap our experience for doing this for two years. Now, as for reviews, um, I do. We we are actually scheduling ahead. I, I have looked ahead. I'm looking to do Quad Heroes next week and the Shadowrun Sixth World starter set next week. Now, for Quad Heroes, all I need to do is I need to try it with teams. I need to try it with teams with the allies where you, you have that like separate little card that has its own unique abilities, not a full character. I haven't tried that yet, so I need to do that. Um, uh, fair warning, it's going to be a positive review. Like, it, it, unless that aspect sucks, well, that'll be the one part that sucks because so far the game's great. So, spoiler, you don't actually have to tune in next week. I've already told you. Um, then Shadowrun, uh, the thing that does need to be noted about that is it will be a read review. Uh, there is no way I'm getting a group together to play Shadowrun until the pandemic's over so i've been holding off and holding off on that one i owe catalyst review of it at this point i'm gonna have to offer him a review because that's the best i can do because at this rate we're not going to be getting together with a group anytime soon yep so with that 
that's going to be one board game and one RPG. And you know what? I think we're going to kick off is a plan to do that. Uh, change up the reviews a bit. We're still going to do two reviews, but I'm going to swap it up. So it's one board game, one rep- RPG each week because we're starting to pile up RPGs that need to be reviewed. So that's going to go on for probably a month or so. There's a, there's enough of it to be reviewed because as always here at Tabletop Bellhop, we're all about all kinds of tabletop games, not just board games. And I might even get a review in there too. Cause I'm, uh, I'm more than halfway through, uh, uh, hack the planet now so there you go there's another rpg review <laughs> we're going on all rpgs all of a sudden <laughs> now a quick shout out and a thank you to our vip guests our sh- patreon backers we greatly appreciate their support now normally we uh shout out five patrons every episode but you know what this is our 100th episode and we really do want to say thank you to everyone that supports us so let's hit the full list tonight Roger Malosh. Thanks, Roger. Zopi, thank you. David Miller Jr. Thanks, Dave. Brian Kurtz, you've been with us since the beginning and we appreciate it so much. Yo Rutila, thank you. Jeff Seuss, thanks, Jeff. Kator, Cat and Tori, thank you. Duran Barnett, thanks. Timothy, Timothy Smith, thanks, Timothy. William Fisher, thank you. Danielle Thomas, thanks, Danielle. Sean P. Kelly of Gaming and BS fame. Thank you. Andrew Dacey. Thank you. Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Ma. Misdirected Mark. Join the Misdirected Mark team every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering at twitch.tv uh, twitch. slash misdirected mark. Evil John, the man who makes me drool over his meat snacks. And Wayne Humphleet. Thanks, Wayne. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to drop that portcullis and lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Uh, If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping your bellhop through our Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers in YouTube every week at 2 a.m. Eastern on Tuesdays. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on. Game on. on.